on behalf of the organizers, let me welcome you to this webinar. Webinar. I'm Jean Maya. I'm a, str a strategic communication specialist from the International Rice Research Institute, or ERI. I will be your MC and moderator for session one of today's webinar. The title of our webinar is Agriculture 4.0 and the Future, Perspectives, Challenges, and Vision. This webinar, organized by ERI, aims to facilitate the exchange of information and experiences on the development and deployment of Agri 4.0 or information and communication technologies. Additionally, we would like to listen to the insights of the students on agriculture and its future. We want to look at agriculture with fresh eyes as we continuously grapple with global challenges and collectively find solutions to these challenges. Uh, before we proceed with session one, I would like to invite John Helen, the platform leader of Sustainable Impact at ERI, to give his opening remarks. John, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jean, and a very good morning to all of you who are listening in. Um, I lead ERI's work on sustainable impact through rice-based systems, and I'm absolutely delighted that we're having this webinar today. Obviously, in different circumstances without COVID, we would be able to meet in person, but there's still a lot that we can achieve through a webinar. Uh, the topic is absolutely critical. Um, the challenges that we have vis-a-vis -vis agriculture, the innovative solutions that are there. And I'm also particularly pleased that we have this mix of students, young people, the next generation, as Jean said, fresh ideas, that's what we need. And mutual learning between the new generation and those who've been working in agriculture for a long, long time. I would urge everyone to have as fruitful and open an exchange as you can do and particularly for the young minds you're the next generation you're the future of agriculture in the philippines and beyond and it's your ideas and your actions which are going to ensure that this country and other places prosper people like me i've still got a few years of uh, my my working life left but um, I, in turn, want to hear and need new ideas, new stimuli coming from you. So please, particularly young people, really engage in this webinar and beyond. Think out of the box. Think as, as ambitiously as you, as you wish. Sometimes you may come up with ideas that may seem silly. Most ideas are not. Be bold enough to articulate them because it's only by these sorts of discussions that we can move forward. So I will be listening in with great interest to the events this morning. Um, I wish all of you every success. I'm delighted that Erie is hosting this and it's wonderful to see the exchanges between the youth, the next generation, and those who have a few more years of experience under their belt. So on that, I'll leave it um, again. Welcome and uh, Let's have a fantastic next two and a half hours. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, John. Let me now invite Sudhiria Dove to lay out uh, the rationale of this webinar. He is also from the Sustainable Impact Platform of ERI, the research leader of the Soil, Water, and Environment Cluster. Take it away, Sudhir. Thank you, Jean. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, we are very pleased to see a very strong participation to discuss this vital topic, Agriculture 4.0, the future, and sharing the perspective, challenges, and vision. I can see that a lot of attendees are still coming in. As Jean said, that uh, there are more than 200 uh, uh, attendees who have registered for this event. Um, the, we, when we were talking about our uh, planning for this webinar um, and we first thought about Agriculture 4.0, uh, we had uh, discussion internally that what it means. Some would argue that fourth agriculture evolution or Agriculture 4.0 has already begun. Um, each previous agriculture evolution uh, was radical at the time. The first one 
uh, representing a transition from hunting and gathering to settled agriculture. That was the phase of agriculture um, in, the, in the beginning. The second one uh, relating to the British agriculture evolution in 18th uh, century, which people often call industrial revolution also. The third one, which perhaps is, no, is most famous or no, known a lot, which happened after the Second World War, um, where there was a significant increase in the productivity. Um, in developing country, it mainly happened with variety, fertilizer, and irrigations. While in developed country, it was because of mechanization. So now we are talking about agriculture 4.0. Uh, in there are two terms, basically, some people call it as a second green revolution. Some people may, who start from kind of beginning call it agriculture 4.0. While this technological innovation is does not new to agriculture, however, there are many emergent technologies across the value chain, including Internet of Things, cloud computing, robotics, artificial intelligence um, that has added a new dimension uh, to agriculture now. And with these technologies, um, we can change the farming beyond recognition. And that was the main motive for us to, to gather together uh, today and talk on this important uh, topic. If we look at the signals which we are receiving from um, policy makers or private sector uh, that suggest that there is already a growing momentum behind agriculture 4.0, especially on the technology development side. So the question comes that when we are talking about this agriculture 4.0, how can this fourth agriculture evolution be socially responsible? Have we factored in the next generation of grower in the concept of agriculture 4.0, or we are just talking about that the current farmers will be the one who can basically cope with this uh, the new concept or and adopt the technologies. Some of the uh, smart technologies may have or may not have the desired impact, well, on farm, on environment, as well as in wider society. And it's very important to consider that one, that agriculture 4.0 remain green. Um, that's very, very important that we not only focus on technology, but also focus on, um, uh, on, the, on, the, on the planet. So this webinar uh, is divided into two sessions. Uh, the first session is focused on listening to the next generation or to, to the next generation whether they will be grower or they will be engaged as a consumer it's very very important to listen listen to them and the objective is to highlight the next generation thinking about agriculture and how it can be further transformed to address the, the challenges of the 21st century we have this uh, another session which focus on, and we have invited expert to that, that uh, session who are working in the field of agriculture 4.0. And we would like to listen from their experience and, and presenting some case studies on ICT, IoT, agriculture 4.0. And most of these case studies are linked um, with soil, climate, and water. And the purpose is not that only we need revolution in this area. The purpose is taking it an example to debate on agriculture 4.0. Um, my last uh, point is that there is no silver bullet to achieve a revolution. And in this session, uh, we will also talk about some critical challenges of implementing these technologies. Thinking about agriculture 4.0 is the first step, but we have to go a long way. And I hope that um, today's sessions will put some thoughts uh, uh, to a wider audience and as a, as a global community, we can achieve this goal. Thank you very much. And I wish uh, a, a productive session today. Thank you, Jean, back to you. Thank you, Sudhir. That gave us an overview of what our audience is going to, to expect today. Uh, moving on, allow me to introduce to you the students who will be joining us for session one. I would like to request you guys to greet the audience, maybe say hi or hello when I call your name. 
uh, if you can turn your camera on, that would be great. Uh, to start off, let me call on Alia Andy Ocampo from Diop National High School. Alia. Thank you. Thank you, Alia. Alison Ko from the University of the Philippines Rural, Rural High School. Good morning, everyone. Carl Gia, also from UP Rural High School. Hello, good morning. Jewel Ronquillo from Diop National High School. Hello, po, good morning. Romer Andre Magpantay from Diop National High School as well. Hello, everyone. Good morning. And last but not the least, Ronald Alain Tavita from UP Rural High School. Hello. Good morning. Good morning to all of you and welcome. Uh, just a quick rundown of the session and some house rules. Uh, the focus of this discussion is to understand what you think about agriculture and how it can be further transformed to address some of the 21st century's biggest challenges, uh, to name a few, growing population, depleting resources, pandemics like COVID-19, climate change, environmental degradation, inequality and injustice, among others. Uh, we are keen on listening to your insights, which might help shape the future innovations in agriculture. Uh, you are highly encouraged to actively participate. Remember, there is no right or wrong answer. Uh, anecdotes are also welcome. Should you wish to speak, press the raise hand button on the platform. You can also do this manually as I will use a gallery view to see all of you. Uh, during the discussion, you are also welcome to interact with other students present uh, present should you wish to react or share something related to what they said. Uh, lastly, mutual respect is expected from all participants. So uh, before we formally begin, let's do a quick virtual exercise. Uh, it's not physical, <laughs> it's really virtual. Uh, I'd like to request our audience uh, to watch out for their screen because we will launch a poll um, for the attendees first. Uh, so, uh, the rule is um, not your insights actually, but what do you think will be the answers of the six students who are with us today on this question? So, I am launching the poll right now and our attendees should see a pop-up on their screen with a question if you are asked to paint a picture with a theme agriculture, how would yours look like? So again, this is what you think will be the answers of the six students who are with us today. I can see around 20 and 20 attendees uh, answering the polls and it's going up continuously. We have, I think the last time I checked, we have around 40 participants. So we're now at 30. Let's give it a few seconds. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. Thank you very much to, uh, to our audience. Um, I'm going to reveal the answers later. Um, now, uh, what I'm going to launch is a poll for our students. Uh, to our audience, if you're also seeing it on your screen, just click the X button. So for our students, if you are asked to paint a picture with the theme agriculture, how would yours look like? A farmer fl plowing the field with a carabao, a farmer using a computer to harvest his or he her produce, a robot gathering data in the field while a drone is flying over it. So let's see. So we have six students. 
Um, and I'm gonna end the poll now because it's complete. Um, now, let me share the results first for what the audience think will be the answer of the students. You can see the screen, you can see the, the, the results, I assume. So um, we have 13 answers or 38% for the first option, which is a farmer plowing the field with a carabao. We have 12 answers, uh, kind of really uh, close to the first option, a farmer using a computer to harvest his or his produce. And we have uh, a, a little low, uh, a little um, uh, a lower answer for the third option, which is a robot gathering data in the field while a drone is flying on it. So, um, Let's say we have 13 and 12 for the first and second option, and let us see if you are right. <laughs> so this is the, the, uh, these are the answers of the students. Um, we have six. I think some of the panelists are also answered, uh, but um, we have six um, who answered uh, a farmer plowing the field with a carabao. Um, before we continue, can I ask our students if uh, you, you, have you been in a field, a rice field, a corn field, or even a garden with vegetables? Again, please uh, raise your hand or um, manually or using the button. Uh, sorry, Alison. Yes, um, actually we are fortunate enough to get to experience uh, planting rice firsthand in our school because we actually consider, uh, we include agricultural, uh, an agricultural subject in our education curriculum. So it's actually in Erie uh, and during our first year in high school. That's awesome. Uh, I also met Allison and we make, made it a point to bring them in the field uh, because uh, she was one of the winners of our essay, uh, video essay contest uh, back in uh, February for the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Um, so I saw Romer also raised his hand. Uh, so Romer, can you please uh, answer the question? Have you been in the field as well? Uh, I have been in a field once in my childhood, but I don't actually remember what kinds of plants or crops are growing in the field. And if you may, Romer, how old are you now? I am 16 years old. Okay, so he said that when he was a kid. So anyone else who wants to share anything? So, so um, can you elaborate your answers? Uh, do your answers reflect how you describe agriculture as you observe it now? Or uh, do those reflect how you want it to be in the future? First, uh, share, share what your answer is. We won't judge you. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, so I'm seeing, just a moment, uh, Ronald raised his hand. Hello po. Um, ang pinili ko pong answer is yung dun po sa may computer. Kasi um, personally po, um, yung father ko po works um, in sa feeds ng um, animals po, yung livestock po. And he uses um, a formulation software na po and I believe yun na po yung future right now po. Kaya yun po yung pinidi kong answer. I see. Um, I also saw Carl raise his hand. Carl, please. Uh, I'm gonna be honest. My answer was a form of plowing the field with a carabao and I think that's what we should revolutionize in agriculture so that the conventional um, picture that most people see will be 
a high tech field and yeah that's a deal thank you thank you so we have um two pers uh, extreme perspectives i guess uh, if i may um who else want to share their answers and why do you uh, why do you think, uh, I, I mean, why did you choose that answers? Um, I see Alison. Okay, I kind of agree with Carl. I choose the first option because currently that's how the society views agriculture, like a farmer flowing the field, which is actually uh, true because farmers are the backbone of our agricultural sector. However, we still need um, innovation, further innovation in terms of technology in order to adapt to our uh, globalization and changing times. Okay, um, actually, Alison, that's my next question. Um, <laughs> what do you think? Can you, can anyone add? I see Ronald raising his hand and I, I want to um, ask Ronald um, uh, to, be, to start off with the, next, uh, the, with the next discussion on what do you think are the challenges and opportunities in agriculture in relation to how you answered our, our first poll? It can be um, current uh, that you are observing, like what you mentioned earlier, and also uh, challenges that you are ante anticipating in the future. Um, but also, um, we want to include opportunities uh, because you also mentioned some of those earlier. Um, I think po na there are definitely things that we can improve on um, in terms of the agriculture. Po. Like we can um, incorporate many innovations, po, but I still think that we should still um, we should still prioritize yung pong farmers natin since they have always been yung pinaka um like yung pinaka nag parang nag um uphold po sa agriculture kaya yun po to our non-Filipino speaking audience uh, both Allison and Ronald highlighted the importance of uh, prioritizing our farmers in our agriculture initiatives and strategies um, so anyone else? I am not sure. Uh, I'm not seeing Jewel and um, I'm not seeing Jewel in the, in my screen and Aliyah. So if you can please use the raise hand button, uh, please do. Anyone who wants to follow Ronald? Um, you can elaborate on your answers. What do you think are the challenges and opportunities in agriculture? Alison, sorry, can I call you again to expand uh, what you said earlier? Um, I said earlier that I think the most pressing challenge agriculture is facing today is how uh, society, specifically, specifically the youth, views it. Um, as you may have encountered recently, there was a trending Facebook post of a module distributed by the Department of Education, wherein in this module, um, a family of farmers are depicted wearing tattered clothes and are portrayed as if they are living in stark poverty. Now, this poor stereotypical depiction it found in a learning module distributed to youths nationwide is only one out of the many discriminations and stereotypes established against farmers and agriculture itself, which is, I think, why students opt to pursue other careers rather than agriculture. And I think that is where the need for further learning comes in, that is achieved in forms like the seminar by agricultural institutions that uh, firsthand knows what agriculture needs and I think the inclusion of agricultural subjects in the education curriculum, because I think it is through these platforms that we can be able to spread the word that agriculture is indeed important and that there is completely nothing wrong or humiliating or degrading about being a farmer, but rather it is something honorable and one of the hardest and most crucial work the society needs. 
Well said, uh, Alison. Anyone who wants to react or make some uh, statements regarding the topic? Okay. Um, I guess um, that's, uh, uh, that concludes our first discussion. Um, to summarize again for our non-Filipino um, uh, viewers, um, our students mentioned that uh, some, some of uh, the technologies are being used already, not just in crops, but also in livestock. And um, one of the things that um, is uh, that uh, one of the challenges that we are facing right now is the stigma that uh, the farmers are depicted as um, those uh, who uh, who can't, uh, for example, uh, buy um, proper clothes uh, and um, just in the field. Um, but uh, as our students mentioned earlier, uh, they already um, mentioned some um, possible opportunities on how we can address those. Uh, it one includes uh, putting into putting some uh, agriculture um, initiatives in the curriculum, and um, some others that are also within the agri agriculture system. Um, now, uh, I'd like to invite our audience again to answer this poll. Um, the, the mechanics is the same. Uh, it's not your insight, but what do you think will be the answer of our students in this question? So the question is, um, just a moment. The question is, what are your plans after finishing school? So this, these are the students' plan, plans after finishing school. Um, the options are to study or work in the engineering field. Uh, the second option is to study or work in the medical field. Uh, the next option would be study or work in the agricultural field or other plans that is not in the option. So we have now from 40, we have now 72 participants. I can see on my screen. Um, so we're going into 40 answers. 30, sorry. So let's try um, 40 plus before I end this poll. So I will share the results results later, but it's kind of uh, different. The, the, the percentage is different for the options. Let's see. Let's see. It's interesting, actually. So we have now 30 plus. So I guess I, I can end this poll. And like earlier, I will launch a poll to our students now. Just the students, uh, we have also our, some of our panelists for the second session uh, in, the, in the virtual room for panelists. So uh, the same question, um, for our six students, what are your plans after finishing school? Okay. Let's see. Yeah. So... Okay, we now have an the answers. I will end the poll. So let me first uh, show you the results of um, the attendees' answers. So 12 said, I hope you're seeing the, the results on your screen. 12 said, um, to study or work in the agricultural field. So and um, eight and seven for uh, um, medical field and the engineering field and uh, four for other plans. So 
Um, the third option, which is uh, study or work in the agricultural field, uh, one, uh, I will stop sharing the results and see if, the, if our audience is correct. So I will share the... So it's a tie for uh, study or work in the medical field and uh, they had other plans. Um, but we had one student who, who answered uh, study or work in the agricultural field. Um, can I ask who is that? Or maybe it's one of our speakers. <laughs> I don't see anyone raising his or her hand. Did one of our speakers answer that? <laughs> so that it has an answer. Um, okay, I don't see anyone raising their hand, but uh, can you elaborate on your answers? Like, um, does your plan include at least contributing to the agriculture sector? Uh, please raise your hand if you want to speak. Uh, I saw Carl. Carl, okay. So I answered the engineering field. I have never actually considered agriculture before as a career, but Researching for Agri 4.0 sparked my interest in the field and it fascinates me actually. So I think I'll just see what the future brings. Awesome. That's nice to hear. Um, there's also a course in the UP, uh, in the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, uh, that is Agricultural Engineering. Um, and we have with us some agricultural engineers today. Um, so that's nice to hear, Ricard, really. So I also saw Alison raise, raise her hand. So Alison, please. Um, my plan after studying, uh, finishing school is to actually study the law and go to a law school because I think, and in that way, I can contribute to the agricultural sector in a way because one of the challenges that agriculture is also facing, particularly the farmers, is inequality and injustice when it comes to the laws present. Because um, the mere existence of such laws that are protecting the rights of these farmers is not enough. Because what's happening in reality is that these laws are being selective and favors only those who have the power or the money to violate it. So I think um, what there should be is people who um, really know the laws and make sure that these laws will be implemented uh, fairly that favors no one. That's true. Um, we are hoping that no one will be left behind, uh, not just by the end of 2030, but also all throughout our existence. Um, if anyone would like to add, uh, I am uh, navigating my screen so that I can see Aliyah and Jewel as well. Uh, but if you want to use the raise hand button on your uh, screen, it's also fine. Anyone would like to uh, add? And if also I may add to the question, um, as uh, the uh, profession or uh, the career path or the life that you um, answer, uh, that you chose, uh, with just just with a poll, um, like for example, as a lawyer or as an engineer or maybe someone uh, who chose the medical field as a doctor, uh, can you share any ideas on how you can contribute to uh, solving the global challenges that we are currently facing in uh, in the context of agriculture, perhaps? Um, so Alison mentioned earlier inequality and injustice. Um, and I also mentioned earlier some of the challenges like uh, growing population, depleting resources, um, pandemics like the, like the COVID-19. Uh, we have also climate change, uh, environmental degradation, and a lot more. Um, so can you please um, 
just just it's not really comprehensive just a, a wild idea or an idea out there so Ro romer yes so i have plans of after wait long. um so i have plans after finishing school that i have, want to be a businessman because i want to take up even though i am currently under the stem program I want to use my knowledge in this to be a successful businessman or even a millionaire actually. So I can donate to other farmers in the Philippines so that they can have financial stability and our economy, our economy will actually grow as steadfast. Uh, not rapidly, but slowly so that it can grow much more from what Thank you, Romer. So, yeah, uh, so we have the term agripreneur. So we're watching out uh, for people like, like Romer who can assist uh, on that aspect. Um, anyone else who would like to add on that discussion? Okay. If there's uh, nothing more to add, um, this is actually a poll just for uh, our students. Uh, so we'll have a poll uh, later for our attendees, but uh, these next two polls will be uh, just for our uh, students. So um, just a moment. Um, I will launch a poll right now and only the students uh, will answer this. If you're seeing a pop-up on your window, just please uh, click the X button. Um, the question is, uh, do you want to be a millionaire? <laughs> uh, the options are, of course, who wouldn't? No, I'm quite happy with what I have right now. And let her see, I'm not sure what the deal, what's the deal first. Okay, we have, we have, okay, I'll end the poll because we're, we're, we're getting more answers. <laughs> um, uh, and we have eight answers right now. Um, so five said they want to immediately have one million and one, uh, two said, interesting, that um, no, I'm quite happy with what I have right now. And the last one said, I'm not sure what the deal, what's the deal for so of course um it will not be g given to you on a single <laughs> uh but uh here's the deal actually uh and, and and i want to ask this question uh to our students that for example right now you are given uh one million pesos to fund your science investigatory project i believe as high school students you have science investigatory projects um, if you will be given 1 million pesos to fund your science investigatory project, but it should be something that would solve a problem related to agriculture, what's going to be your proposal? So like earlier, it doesn't have to be comprehensive. You just, uh, you can just throw in ideas and it can be as simple as possible, but with impactful solution, or on the other hand, it can be as grand and ambitious. After all, you have one, an imaginary one million to spare. So anyone? Anyone who wanna start? I'm not sure I'm not seeing uh, Jewel's uh, camera, uh, camera right now and also Aliyah. Um, I can see it now, Aliyah. So if anyone wants to start, um, again, there's no wrong or, or right answer. Uh, all, um, it can be in the past, by the way. Uh, so, okay. 
because I remember when I was in high school, I had a science investigatory project also that is related to agriculture, but it's in livestock. <laughs> um, so can I call on uh, Ronald now? I see three students raising their hands. So I'll start off with Ronald. Yes, well, um, I think if I'm given 1 million pesos to, be, to fund um, an investigatory project, it will probably to tackle climate change because climate change is one of the most important issues we have to solve right now, especially since um, most of uh, the highest or the most significant world leaders we have right now um, neglect or probably dismiss the issue because they don't think it's an issue we have to tackle right now and we have to tackle, for example, poverty or economic um, problems. But I really think that we should tackle climate change right away. And I'm hearing that some leaders are seeing that by 2030 they might start, but I really think that we should start this decade or at least in a couple, in a few more years because um, climate change is an issue and it has always been an issue for a long time. And um, it has affected many things, and many things, many fields in this world. And um, we have been seeing the changes it caused. And, um, and I just believe that we should tackle that immediately. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, I also see Carl raising his hand. Over to you, Carl. Um, I'm very interested in developing drone technology that would perhaps have sensors that would detect the weather. Or this may be a dream, but I want a sensor that can detect incoming tests or diseases so that we can limit it to a certain extent before it actually spreads. Yeah, thank you. Carl, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, it's just me, uh, but it, it, the, your audio was uh, kind of broken uh, a while ago. Can you please uh, repeat the last sentence that you said? Detect, uh, and I, I, I only heard detect and plants. Um, detect incoming diseases and pests that, so that we can limit it to a certain extent before it actually can spread. Thank you. That was heard clearly. Anyone who wants to follow Carl? I see um, Alison. I'm not sure if Ronald is uh, raising his hand again. Uh, Alison first and then uh, Ronald. And I hope to hear also from Alia and Joel. Uh, I'm, please uh, chat our tech if you're having having problem with your camera or audio. So, okay, Alison. Um, I think my research would basically be about to address the depletion of resources, natural resources specifically, particularly soil, plants, uh, plants, water. Uh, that is really fundamental to the structure and. Um, function of agricultural systems because historically speaking um, the agricultural development only has uh, narrowly focused on increased productivity without really taking into consideration natural resource management so if ever I have a million uh, pesos to fund a research I think it would be to find a more holistic systems oriented approach that integrates uh, natural resource management with food and nutritional security. Awesome. Uh, am I seeing Ronald raise his hand again? Okay, yes. Um, I would just like to add to what I said a while ago, and um, I want to elaborate why we have to tackle climate change now more than ever, because we might be looking at the peak of our, um, of our civilization if we don't tackle it immediately since it's down from here if we neglect the issue any longer like I believe that we should consider the children of the future um, who are going to live in this world and they're just going to see the world in which we neglected the problems before and now they're going to experience worse and worse from there 
and this is why I think I really think that climate change um, is an important issue. Thank you for elaborating your answer. Um, I hope to hear from Romer, uh, Joel, and Aliyah as well. Um, if you can uh, uh, acknowledge the question. Um, I'm not sure what you answered. Uh, maybe it's the second one that you don't want the million pesos. But if you have an imaginary one million pesos, and you are given the chance to spend it on a science investigatory project right now. But uh, the deal is it should be something related to agriculture. Um, you can just throw in an idea or you can share something that you have done before. It can be simple or uh, a grand dream that you are thinking, but uh, you just don't have the best. Okay. So I'm seeing Romer and Aliyah raise their hand. Let's start with Romer first. And Aliyah, please uh, follow uh, Ro Ro after uh, Ro Romer. So if I were to have a 1 million peso and I'm going to boost the agricultural improvement of our country, I want to help farmers be more efficient and have more welfare towards themselves because what I have read on Child Fund, farmers, fishermen, and children, I mean in the PSA that farmers, fishermen, and children are in the line of poverty in the Philippines. I want to help them to establish themselves and give them more prioritize, priority towards themselves because they are, according earlier, they are the backbone of our agriculture. So I want them to be more efficient thank you Romer that is very related to what you shared earlier that you want to be a businessman uh, so Aliyah can you follow Ro Romer Greener-based machine that helps farmers to farm more quickly and more efficiently. So I'm not sure if the audience heard um, what Alia said. Uh, the audience kind of low, uh, but uh, what uh, can I just repeat what she said that she wants to develop something that will help the farmers to uh, farm or. Um, more efficiently. Is that right, Aliyah? Yes. Okay. You want to develop something? Is that like an ICT or a, a program or what, 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 what's it going to be, Aliyah? Can you expand on that answer? I think it will be a program where, there, where the or it will be a robot that will help the farmers to to, to farm to farm the to farm the crops quickly and efficiently. Okay, so I, let me just repeat: it's a robot that will help the farmer uh, um, do farming more quickly and efficiently. Um, so Jewel is also raising her hand. Let's give the floor to Jewel. So for 1 billion, I'm interested in planting crops without using any soil and or it will just grow in the water using some minerals since madami nang nagbibuild ng buildings and nababawasan na yung ano, pag, uh, ano, ng mga, pagtataniman ng mga ano. So I want that. Yeah, so Joel is talking about uh, the depletion of uh, natural, some natural resources like the soil and um, making the farming also more efficient uh, by utilizing minerals. Um, so we have some uh, technologies like that in agriculture right now. One is hydrophonics. 
Um, and uh, I guess Joelis also wants to talk about urban agriculture because uh, she said that there are already buildings nowadays and there are no soils to plant the crops with, uh, on. Um, so we're nearing the end of this discussion. Um, I want to launch a poll again. Uh, and this time it's still for our students. Um, this question is um, just to know if you're familiar with um, what our speakers are going to discuss today. Um, so have you heard of Agriculture 4.0? I guess I know that Carl's answer because he, he mentioned this earlier. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll because uh, it's exceeding six uh, votes, which should be the case. And um, the results show uh, that um, six, uh, maybe all of them have heard of Agri 4.0. And uh, the reason why I'm why I asked that question is um, it's. Uh, the session two will also focus on some ICTs, IOTs, and uh, the discussion on Agri 4.0. Um, so, so these ICTs and um, some IOTs are available in the agriculture sector right now. Maybe some of those include um, what you mentioned earlier, some concepts and um, ideas of what you, what you mentioned earlier. Um, but uh, before that, um, I want to ask, um, can you share us, for those who answered yes, they have heard of Agri 4.0, can you share with us some keywords or maybe concepts that you want to share with us uh, about Agri 4.0? You can just share about keywords that you remembered when you encountered Agri 4.0. And let's see if um, we can tie it in in the discussion of session two. Can I have one answer? Oops, I saw Carl and then Allison. Sorry, Carl, you're on mute. So I remember that Agri 4.0 is smart farming. It is information driven and aims to improve productivity by lowering costs. One objective of Agri 4.0 is ending world hunger. As some of us may be aware, by 2050, we need to produce 70% 70, 70 more food today because it is expected that our population will go to 9 billion people. And right now, with 7 billion people, eight, more than 800 million experience chronic hunger. And if we cannot, if we cannot sustain our current population today, how so if, if, if our population goes to 9 billion? So as, as much as we need change, we also need the efforts of the government, investors, and improving technology. Thank you, Carl. Uh, that's a lot talking of, uh, about collaboration uh, to solve the challenges that we are going to face uh, in the next few years. So uh, I would give the floor to Alison, then Aliyah, and then Romer. If uh, the student finishes, you can uh, follow. Uh, similar to what Carl said, Agriculture, agriculture 4.0 is actually about transforming Philippine agriculture into a dynamic um, high growth sector that is essential for our country to speed up recovery, especially considering that we are in the middle of a pandemic right now. And if there is one thing that the pandemic had taught us is that we learned how to determine which ones really matter and which does not. 
we realize that tourism can stop for a while, businesses can close, even education was postponed for a few months, but agriculture has to continue. So now more than ever, do we need the, do we see the need for agriculture to adapt to such drastic changes with new technologies and innovations, which is which can be achieved through agriculture 4.0? Alia. I haven't heard so about agriculture for Romer. So same as Alia, I haven't heard of agriculture 4.0, but I have my information or my observation towards what at the Allison and Kuya Carl said earlier. So I think the utilization of technologies will be in use of the, will be the most driving factor in the agriculture sector and they will be more efficient used. And from based on, from what I read also, that it will be more cost effective and have more, and will help farmers gain more agricultural gain. Thank you. Um, before we end this session, um, let's go back to our title, uh, to our little, I mean, little painting through our imagination exercise earlier during the uh, first part of this session. Uh, we all know that the sustainable development, development goals set in 2015 are intended to, uh, to be achieved by uh, 2030. To ensure that no one is left behind, the goals include no poverty, zero hunger, reduce inequalities, uh, among others. Uh, in relation to our collective ambition, our current state, and the limitless opportunities, how do you, how do young people like you see agriculture ten to fifteen years from now? Uh, uh, at this point, I would like to call everyone. And I would like to start with Aliyah. I think the I see agriculture for the ten years having a program or an innovation to to make the farmers farm pretty or it it will help them to grow the crops quickly. Romer, please uh, follow Alia. So I view the agricultural improvement of our country 10 to 15 years from now. I wish and I hope to see that our economic growth is improving rapidly and drastically based from what I have read again, our yeah policies and regulations are enough for the Philippines, but it's the national levels and local levels that are at stake here. So I want to see improvement in the next 10 to 15 years and our improvement as a country as a whole. Thank you. Alison, please. I think optimistically speaking with our uh, just if the youth learn to appreciate and acknowledge the importance of agriculture, I think I can see this sector being dynamic and really um, improving our economic growth, not just in supplying our, um, our staple foods of rice and food crops, but also providing livelihood and contributing greatly, as I said earlier, to our econ national economic growth. Thank you. Uh, Joel, please follow. So our future agriculture will use sophisticated technologies such as robots, temperature and moisture sensors, aerial images and GPS technology, and those advanced devices and precision agriculture and robotic system will allow farms to be more profitable, efficient, safe, and environmentally friendly. Thank you. That's very holistic. Um, can you... Please follow Ronald. Um, in 10 to 15 years, I hope that all of the goals, the sustainable development goals and the objectives of Agriculture 4.0 is met. 
and that um, we are able to implement the implement the technologies and um, other innovations in agriculture in order to solve world hunger. And um, I also hope that there is no more injustices or inequalities in this sector and um, for justice to be brought to those who has who have still uh, haven't gotten it yet. Um, Carl? So I see the future of Agri 4.0 as it is developed and evolved in such a way that world hunger would be declining and food production would be efficient such that rather than just gaining profits, production of food is focused on providing the necessity for the people. Yeah. Thank you. Did I miss anyone? No? Okay, I called everyone. So, uh, thank you for that. Uh, those are very optimistic um, vision for the Philippine agriculture sector. Um, we are hoping for your active involvement through your uh, profession, through the professions that you will be um, taking uh, in the future. Uh, thank you very much. We discussed some challenges um, that includes um, making farming equitable, more equitable, and more sustainable uh, in terms of the uh, efficient use of our resources. Um, and also uh, protecting the environment at that. We also talked about some stigma and some solutions on how we can address those um, challenges. Um, we uh, launched a poll earlier, if you would want to uh, get 1 million pesos, what would you do with that uh, in, the, in your current capacity? Uh, like a science investigatory project and we heard some ideas ranging from uh, business and um, again relating to making farming more equitable and also making farming more efficient in terms of um, including uh, programs, uh, robots, uh, drones I, I heard earlier um, and thank you very much for that. Um, Again, we will discuss uh, some technologies, uh, ICT, uh, Internet of Things, and some uh, concepts related to Agri 4.0 in the next session. And uh, right now, please accept uh, our sincerest gratitude, Aliyah, Allison, Carl, Joel, Romer, and Ronald. Uh, thank you for actively participating. This ends our session one. Let me turn this over to our next host and moderator for session two. Martin, please take it away. Hi, uh, thanks Jean uh, for that. Um, that was a, such an interesting discussion with, uh, with the students. Um, you know, it's refreshing to hear some of these out of the box ideas uh, from, from, from the younger generation on how we can really like modernize and transform agriculture. Um, as we strive to kind of future proof our, our food systems, I think, you know, when I, when I was, when I was 16 years old, that was not, it was not really the first thing on, on, on my mind. So it's really great to see some of these really bright minds, um, thinking, thinking about these things on how we can future proof our, our food systems. Um, so we're now uh, going into the second part of our webinar. Um, but, but first I want to say hi to our, our live audience. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Martin Packer. I'm the Senior Manager for Advocacy and Brand uh, at Erie, and I'll be your MC and moderator for the for the second session, um, which is on experience sharing, technical and deployment challenges in, in developing an, an Agri 4.0. Um, but before I proceed, I, I'd like to know where our viewers are tuned in from. Um, so my colleagues are going to be launching a poll right now. Um, so please share with us um, where are you from where are you watching this webinar. So please take a moment to, um, to fill that in. Thank you, thank you everyone. Um, so we're delighted to have you here with us today. Do we, do we have, a, do we have a, a, result, a result from the poll? All of us from Asia, all right. So it is, so it is just a good morning, still a good morning for everyone. 
Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so to continue, <clears throat> this session is designed to be um, kind of like an avenue for, for mutual learning uh, through information exchange and sharing of experiences in developing and deploying uh, Agri 4.0 or, uh, or in information communication technologies, ICT. Um, and in particular, we will, we're going to be hearing from, from our speakers uh, some examples of these digital tools and, and the innovations in the ag sector. So, um, so this session is going to be divided into four parts. Um, the first part will focus on, on some overviews of specific technologies um, which have been developed by academia, by government offices, uh, under the Department of Agriculture, um, by Erie, and then also by the private sector. So we've got, so we've got a good group of all of these representatives uh, together today to be, to be speaking about them. Um, and so each speaker will have, uh, will have 10 minutes. I'll be, I'll be very strict in timekeeping. Um, and then we'll proceed to a, a moderated discussion where I'll ask one question to each of our panelists <clears throat> and then two questions for, for everyone. And after that, we'll open up the floor to questions from our audience. So you can send in your questions through the chat box uh, found on your screen and we'll try to accommodate as many as we can, um, time and volume permitting towards the end of the session. Um, and at the end of the session, Dr. Manuel Jose uh, Regalado from uh, the Philippine Rice Research Institute, Phil Rice, will wrap up the discussion and deliver a closing message. So to officially start session two, let me briefly introduce our first speaker, uh, who is engineer Tony and May Salcedo, who is a senior science, who's a senior science research specialist at the University of the Philippines in Los Baños. Uh, engineer Salcedo will discuss uh, smarter technologies for crop water management. The floor is yours, Engineer Salcedo. Um, thank you, Martin. So I will um, share my screen. Oh, well. Okay. So um, good morning, everyone. I am Tony Ann May Salcedo, one of the researchers of Project Serai. And I am here to discuss the different technologies that our team, crop water management, um, smarter, technolo smarter technologies for crop water management has developed. Let us first discuss the current status of water allocation in the Philippines. Being an archipelagic country, the Philippines is endowed with an abundance of water. We have about 400, more than 400 billion cubic meters of water um, per year, and around 90 billion cubic meters is withdrawn annually for the domestic, the industrial, and the agricultural sector. 80% of the total volume of water withdrawn is allotted for agriculture, and 98.6% of this is intended for irrigation alone. Um, despite having the largest consumption of fresh water, agriculture is the least priority among these sectors. And with the increasing population and urbanization, there is a competition for limited water resources. In, or, we, in order, uh, we need to address, in order for us to address this, bet, we need to have better irrigation management strategies. There are different smart crop water technologies um, being developed and promoted to farmers for them to practice smart irrigation, which is um, applying the right amount of water to crops at the right time and place. This practice um, will help our farmers optimize their production and will also minimize the adverse effects of untimely irrigation. Our team, um, project two, sorry, project 2.3 has developed and is promoting a couple of technologies for smart irrigation. One is the use of an ethnometer for evapotranspiration based irrigation scheduling, and the other is the WISE. Let us first start with the ethnometer. An ethnometer is an instrument developed by ET Gage that measures the actual evapotranspiration in the area. The measurements from this instrument can be used for evapotranspiration based irrigation scheduling. An ethnometer has uh, different parts. It has a diffusion cover that 
simulates the crop canopy. A uh, wet porous ceramic cup that mimics a crop evapotranspiration. A uh, water gauge for manually monitoring the water the change in water level. And it can also be equipped with a data logger for automatic recording of the change in water levels. In the app monitor, it, op it works as, um, as the water evaporates from the ceramic cup, it creates an upward pool that causes a change in the water level in the gauge tube. And this change in the water level represents the rate of evapotranspiration, which we can then use for our irrigation scheduling. It is also recommended to calibrate this instrument to empirical formulas um, to get more accurate res results, which we will then use to estimate the amount of crop that we need to apply to our crops. Given the evapotranspiration measurements from the ethnometer, um, agrometeorological parameters from an AWS or a nearby weather station, our team has developed the Sarai ETO calculator. It is an evapotranspiration based irrigation scheduling web application where the user can create their own account for them to record and monitor the evapotranspiration measurements from their station um, for um, generation of irrigation advisories. As you can see here, uh, you, the user can create, um, their, they can customize their accounts based on farm, crop, um, and soil information and the station where they will be getting their um, data. The end user will also have to input in um, regularly the evapotranspiration measurements from their monitor or agrometeorological parameters from stations, weather stations for the system to analyze and to generate an irrigation advisory and give recommendations on when and how much water to irrigate our crops. The next technology that our team has developed is a soil moisture monitoring tool called WAIS or Water Advisory for Irrigation Scheduling System. Uh, WAIS is composed of a field unit and a computer software. The field unit has a, has, is comprised of soil moisture sensors, a transmitting data logger, and a solar panel. The sensors are installed at different depths depending on the effective rooting depth of the crop planted. It continuously measures the soil moisture uh, in the field and will send this information or transmit this information to the Y server via mobile network. In the Y server, um, information or data from field units will be analyzed and it will generate an irrigation advisory and recommendation uh, on how much to irrigate and when to irrigate via text message. It will send this information via text message to the end users. And so now that um, we have all this de technologies developed, of course, there were some challenges that our team encountered. First, um, let's first um, see the, uh, during the conception of the technologies. Of course, before we were able to design or have an idea on what we want to develop, we first had to identify what were our goals. What um, issues do we want to address with these technologies? So. First is we want to help increase crop production and we also want to promote smart irrigation to our farmers to improve their water use efficiency. So now that we have these goals in mind, we were then able to design and develop uh, our technologies. Of course, there were also um, some challenges during, this, during the development stage of these technologies. First is in the design and assembly of the field unit or the YX field unit. We had some um, challenges. We found it quite laborious since we had to manually put together uh, the different parts and components of, this, of the field unit. 
and there were some there were also some concerns on the availability and accuracy of this off the shelf um, components another is in the coding and programming of the wise software and the um, web application so um, there is a need to um, debug and upgrade the system regularly and based on observations during field testing and um, validation. Um, we also encountered some issues on the availability of crop and soil uh, information since we will need those for the, for the analysis of the systems. In the testing and validation of um, our technologies, some of the challenges that we encountered is first in the establishment of the demo site and the identification and isolation of issues and errors that occur during field testing and in the validation of the advisories provided by the WISE software and the uh, um, web application. Lastly is in the deployment of these technologies. Uh, some of the concerns that arise when, whenever we um, discuss the deployment of our technologies is first in the affordability of the system. Of course, when we were trying to develop and design um, WISE, for example, we wanted it to be affordable and to be cheaper than commercially available soil moisture sensors. But of course, um, farmers are, are quite hesitant to invest on on systems that on new technologies that they have not seen firsthand the performance and the workability and have not understand how this will help them um, improve their production hence the the challenge in the widespread adoption of these new technologies i think this is where um the national government agencies or LGUs can come into play. Um, through them, they will be able to help promote um, projects and developments from short-term from short-term projects like Sarai, um, and to help our farmers adopt to this uh, adopt these technologies for their um, for the improvement and efficiency in their farming activities. And, the government or the L or the LGUs can also help um, us in the monitoring of the long-term effect of these technologies um, to the farmers and to the agricultural sector as well. Uh, Engineer Salcedo, may I request uh, one more minute to wrap up, please? Yes. So actually, I'm already done. So that's it for my presentation. Thank you and have a nice day. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Engineer Salcedo, for, for giving us uh, that overview of a, of a very wise, wise technology um, in, in Project Sarai. Uh, so our next speaker is Mr. Uh, Jovino de Dios. Uh, apologize if I, if I haven't uh, pronounced it correctly. Um, Supervising Science Research Specialist for Soil and Water Science at uh, Phil Rice. Mr. De Dios will share with us an overview of uh, Phil Rice's information system, or PRISM, and uh, their experience in developing this, uh, this technology. Mr. De Dios, please proceed with your presentation. Hello, good morning. Can I share my screen? Absolutely, yes. Is it clear now? Yes, I think if you if you would if you could put it on full screen, it would uh, it would be yes. There yeah. we go. Yeah. Yes. So good morning. Thank you very much for inviting us to share with you and talk about the experience of Prism. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, Joe de Dios, the head of the Prism unit stationed here at Phil Rice. Um, PRISM is now generating rice information system using satellite. It is a matured technology 
uh, that was de jointly developed by Phil Rice and Kiri with funding from the Philippine government's Department of Agriculture. As our DA secreta secretary said, modernization in agriculture must continue because industrialization of agriculture is the key and we are now in agriculture 4.0 and uh, the agriculture point 4.0 is well understood at these days uh, even those students that uh, are uh, currently attending now as they have expressed their opinion and uh, insights about the agriculture 4.0 Modernizing agriculture will make our farmers to be more productive, farming to be more profitable, and Filipinos to be more food secure. The Philippine Rice Information System has the vision of uh, a satellite-based rice information towards a rice secure Philippines. And with a mission, to support the Department of Agriculture in making informed decisions for policy formulation and planning for the provision of timely and reliable rice information based, based on remote sensing, crop modeling, and information and communication technologies. Uh, PRISM has started modernizing the, gather, the gathering of rice production situation in a near real time mode since its full operation in, in uh, 2018 by using the state of the art technologies like remote sensing or using the satellite images, online technologies, geographic information systems, and crop growth simula simulations models. So Prism has this concept, conceptual framework. First, uh, it gathers information from the satellite and ground data by deployed data collectors in the field, facilitated by regional offices of the Department of Agriculture (LGU) and uh, uh, yeah, and, and MLGU and PLGU. Then this uh, data automatically. Uh, uh, conveyed to, to some com computer systems for validation, localization, and storage. And uh, it can be now used to process data by uh, rice, uh, rice remote sensing specialist, crop modeler, some cartographer, and some information manager. And of course, it will uh, end up into information sharing using the online technologies to targeted users like Department of Agriculture, our partners, and general public. Of course, information technology now embodies some sec uh, data security issues, network computing infrastructure, and field operation systems procedures. These uh, are the governing principles on how PRISM uh, operates. What are the technologies being used by PRISM or the Philippine Rice Information System? First is the remote sensing. It is defined as obtaining information about objects or areas from a distance, typically from aircraft or satellite. In case of PRISM, we are using satellite uh, because satellite captures land images far beyond or in the outer space. It can capture a much, much larger area in a single shot. It can get a high resolution image of the whole country in a very short period of time. The next uh, technology is the crop growth simulation models, which uses simulation software that estimate crop yield as a function of weather, conditions, soil properties, and crop management practices. Crop simulation models uses the, uh, this technology with the use of computers. You cannot harvest the actual crop materials, but you can harvest knowledge in very, very uh, much ahead of time. 
that you can uh, get, get, get the same in actual growing condition but uh, waiting for a uh, longer period of time in case of rice is around three to four months. But if you use crop simulation models, you can get the knowledge or the information on uh, gr uh, crop growth performance in a matter of uh, uh, less than one month or some other past computers can generate information in a matter of several days. Of course, this uh, GIS or the Geographic Information System can analyze and visualize some spatial, spatial data and information using maps. It, uh, GIS can place any bit of information in a map so that you can easily visualize and, uh, and understand information where, where it came from. And of course, information systems or the information technology like a very, very much common now, which is internet, uh, it can convey message data in a matter of a fraction of seconds uh, in any place of uh, the earth wherein the infrastructure is existing. Now, for the remote sensing, Uh, which is, uh, ha uh, we have two very common uh, types of remote sen sensing. First is uh, the optical remote sensing, which uh, the camera from the satellites get, gets its uh, energy as, uh, from a natural source like the sun. And this is very effective during daytime and for clear weather. What if uh, during the night time or if there is some weather disturbance as, like thick clouds, the optical uh, cameras from satellite cannot be used. That's why uh, PRISM are using this radar, radar remote sensing. In radar remote sensing, um, it works at any time of the day and weather. At any ground image cannot be obstructed by clouds because the energy uh, that is being reflected from the object is directly coming from the ra radar itself while the optical uh, it uses some na uh, natural lights like the sun and the optical uh, uh, frequency can be obstructed by clouds. That's why PRISM is using the multi-temporal synthetic radar aperture remote sensing technology. SAR is a type of uh, radar uh, camera that can uh, be used uh, for capturing ground information in several multi-path patterns and uh, multi-temporal uh, uh, patterns. So... The synthetic, uh, how does uh, SAR remote sensing work for lowland rice? We know that uh, SAR or the synthetic radar aperture radar remote sensing can see objects beyond clouds or under the clouds or, uh, or some any other uh, destructions or even the night time. And now we are using this uh, principle uh, by applying in agriculture because during the land preparation especially in rice which is flooded the whole land preparation in rice in rice production is uh, flooded uh, when, when when an area that can be sent by radar sat is be is uh, flooded there is no image coming back or reflected back to the satellite and uh, what the satellite sees is black. When the young rice crop starts to grow, some signal is reflected back to the image. Then the what the satellite sees is uh, around gray or dark or it becomes darker. And 
as the crop grows, more signal is reflected. The, the image is becoming more darker and maybe light gray or light white as seen in the picture. Different star images captured at different times are, are being used by Prism. This is to generate the what we call the lowland rice cropping system signature to identify rice planted areas from any other crops or any other things in the land surface. As illustrated in this graph, which, uh, which was mentioned a while ago, during the land preparation, the signal, uh, the, the, back is, the uh, radar box scatter is the signal. The, this is the energy being sent from the, from the satellite and reflected back from the surface of the Earth. When the surface or the land mass has water surface in it, there is no or very little backscatter reflected back to the satellite. And if uh, the rice uh, crop begins to grow and cover some the water beneath, uh, beneath the foliage or the canopy, the signal uh, coming back from the Earth's surface to the satellite uh, becomes stronger, and the in, and which is being interpreted as in the color uh, scheme as becoming uh, lighter and lighter. And of course, this is a growth curve. If uh, the crop begins be, be, beginning to mature, uh, some water in the field be subsides and up to the harvesting. During the harvesting, it is advisable that there's no um, uh, pounded water in the field anymore, and the color becomes uh, darker again. So this is what we call the lowland rice cropping system signature. This is uh, different from upland rice cropping, because upland rice cropping do not flood the field before uh, the, the establishment of the crop. And the uh, upland rice cropping system cannot be detected by this uh, technology or this system. So we uh, are using... Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Mr. De Dios. Um, could I ask you to use the next 60, 60 seconds, the next minute to wrap up, please? Yes, okay. So we Thank are you. using uh, several uh, SAR satellites as uh, presented in the in the slide and uh, for for a one season cropping to be uh, generated uh, we are using around 600 images uh, these are some uh, examples how the the remote se low and rest remote sensing is being interpreted in a GIS and of course, um, remote sensing needs some field work to collaborate some ground information data from the satellite data being, which uh, during the ground data collection, we are using the smartphone in collecting some uh, field information. And of course, uh, based on the leaf area index that uh, is being captured by the satellite, uh, it can be put in a crop simulation model to estimate uh, the crop yield. And of course, we have this infrastructure. And uh, the most importantly, we have this uh, 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 data products, the rice area monthly and in season tabul uh, tabulated, the planting dates, yield estimates, rice areas at risk during flood and drought, and extent of areas affected by flood and drought. Uh, rice production situation in the monitoring field. So these are some uh, of our outputs that can be accessed from our website. This is the uh, monthly estimate of rice planting dates. These uh, are the uh, areas that uh, was flooded during uh, Pepito. So these are just a map representation of some yield levels. 
And we have some tabulated data. We have also some graphical information from our websites. So what's the impact of this uh, uh, project? Uh, support data for day is central and they are supposed to strategize their operations. It's also uh, served as supplementary data to day's decision and ensuring rice efficiency during lean months and in times of calamity. Uh, targeting of productivity enhancing technologies, the RCEP program in seed distribution, projection of seed requirement, reference for farm market for farm to market road establishment. Scientific basis for our and proposals, development of land use map. So, boosted farmers' competitiveness through the policies and programs created by the A. So, I think uh, this is the last slide. And uh, my last word is. Our future is unwritten. We have to invent it. We have to make it and make it good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. De Dios, <clears throat> for walking us uh, through this, um, one of the, the, the Department of Agriculture's products. And, and I do apologize for having had to rush you through at the end. It's, a, it's an extremely interesting, and, and I think you know, we, could, we could probably speak, dedicate an entire, entire webinar to this. Um, but um, so our next, uh, and we will, we will give the opportunity to, to elaborate a little bit further in the Q&A. Um, our next speaker is, is also from the Department of Agriculture, um, engineer Patrick Espanto, who is an engineer too of the Agrohydrology and Rain Simulation section of the Bureau of uh, Soil and Water Management, or the B, uh, BSWM. And he will give us an overview of the BSWM automatic weather stations and we'll discuss the innovations that it contributed to the Philippine agriculture. Engineer Expantio, please, uh, Expantio, please take it away. Yep, uh, good morning. Can you see my uh, screen now? Yes. All right. Just gonna press the presentation. Okay, uh, once again, good morning to all the attendees of this uh, seminar and uh, before I begin I would like to introduce myself once again I'm Patrick Espanto from the Bureau of Soils and Water Management of the Department of Agriculture and uh, today I will be presenting about the uh, automatic weather stations and how this uh, AWS can be used uh, for agriculture 4.0. This will be the outline of my presentation first I'm going to quickly uh, discuss the mandate of uh, the Bureau of Soils and Water Management and then next, uh, I'll be uh, discussing the milestones of uh, the Agromet uh, presentation, uh, Agromet uh, stations, and uh, um, the description of how this uh, AWS uh, work, and uh, the importance and the uses of AWS in agriculture, and uh, lastly, the challenges and the way forward for uh, the automatic uh, weather stations. So uh, the Bureau of Soils and Water Management uh, has a mandate and uh, through our section, the ag Agrohydrology and Rain Simulation section, under the Water Resources Management Division, is uh, mandated to facilitate and provide assistance in the establishment of uh, agromet uh, stations and other relevant instruments uh, such as uh, the automatic weather stations, soil moisture sensors, as uh, sources of uh, real-time microclimatic information in different agroclimatic and, of course, to process and analyze the collected uh, data from these uh, sensors. Um, the BSWM, uh, as early as 1979, started the establishment of uh, these uh, agromet stations and um, uh, included in the agromet stations are these instruments um, and the parameters that are being measured, which are air temperature, evaporation, rainfall, atmospheric pressure, humidity, dew point, surface uh, wind speed and direction, solar radiation, sunshine duration, and uh, cloudiness. So these are the instruments that you can see in a, in a typical agromet station. So for those students who are near the UP Los Baños, if you happen to visit the, the National Agromet Station of uh, UPLB or 
uh, the one that are installed in, uh, uh, in, in the Erie, you can see these instruments. So they are all uh, manually, manual instruments and the data are collected are also, um, the data obtained are manually collected. So uh, looking from the uh, perspective of uh, the BSWN, uh, we have these uh, milestones. So as I've mentioned earlier, the, the BSWM started installation of uh, agromet stations as early as 1979. And uh, from, from that year onwards, the first uh, AWS or automatic weather station installed uh, was in uh, 2003. There were four um, in, uh, uh, which was funded by the ACR project. And uh, the next one uh, was in, uh, in 2008. So it was funded under the Jirgas project. ACR is uh, uh, funded by the Australian government. A uh, Jirgas is funded by the uh, Japan government. And uh, there are uh, other funding, international funding institutions. The ADRC, six uh, AWS were installed. In 2010, there were also six. And uh, the most uh, recent one is uh, from the US uh, PL480 uh, fund we're in uh, the BSWM in collaboration with other um, agencies established uh, 100 automatic weather stations. So these are some of the pictures that uh, uh, show um, the installation of the early type of uh, AWS of uh, BSWM. So this one is uh, under the ADRC project. This one is in Negros Occidental. Uh, the picture on the right is, uh, from Samba, is in Sambuanga del Norte. Uh, one in Camarines Norte and uh, one in uh, Bataan, uh, Bataan Peninsula State University. So as I've mentioned earlier, in 2012, uh, we were able to get uh, funding from the USPL 480 uh, uh, funding uh, project uh, entitled Establishment of Agrometeorological Station in Highly Vulnerable Agricultural Areas, a Tool for Climate Change Adaptation and in the development of local early warning system. So uh, these are uh, 100 new uh, automatic weather stations and uh, included uh, on top of the 100 AWS, there are also, there were also five, 53 uh, PAGASA and uh, ASTI or the uh, Advanced Science and Technology Institute of the DOST, uh, AWS uh, upgraded under that project. And uh, this, uh, this AWS, unlike the previous uh, AWS that were installed by the BSWM, is uh, equipped with a telemetry system. So the data that's being collected uh, from the AWS is transmitted to, to the uh, web server and uh, can be viewed, the data can be viewed online by the users. So these are some of the pictures uh, of the AWS funded under that uh, project, the USPL 480. So one in Cagayan, one in uh, Davao Oriental. And uh, the distribution of uh, this AWS are presented here. So they are uh, distributed uh, nationwide from regions uh, CAR to ARM. And uh, most of uh, this AWS are, are uh, received by the LGU or the recipients of this AWS are um, the local government units. Some are from the uh, state colleges and universities. Some are some received by the Department of Agriculture Regional Field Offices, and uh, we also have uh, uh, installed three from the BSWM uh, research uh, centers. And uh, um, Aside from the AWS installed by the BSWM, the, the Department of the, field, the regional field offices of the Department of Agriculture also procured the same type of AWS, which uh, are funded under the RICE program of the DA, and they are being maintained by the DA RFOs. And also there are AWS uh, being established by private companies uh, like the Aboitis, and uh, also uh, some NGOs like the Rice Watch Action Network and other government institutions like PAGASA for various purposes and uh, objectives that are, um, most of them are overlapping. So uh, to just briefly discuss uh, what is an AWS. So AWS, unlike the agromet station, is a compact uh, equipment 
powered by storage battery and uh, solar cells. And uh, they are more accurate and dependable instrument for collecting climatic data. And uh, as uh, the parameters that are being collected by this AWS are uh, similar with the data of the agrimet station. And these are the wind speed, direction, rainfall, amount and intensity, pressure, RH, uh, temperature, solar radiation, sunshine duration, temperature, and the soil uh, moisture. So these are the, the parts of uh, uh, the latest AWS that uh, BS, BSWM installed in uh, 2012. So this one is uh, a design um, done by the DOST Advanced Science and Technology. So we have uh, uh, different uh, weather sensors. So um, these are labeled in the photo. And uh, let me use the laser pointer. So this one is the, the data logger. And uh, the data logger is uh, powered by, of course, the solar panel and uh, the battery. So whenever the, the solar panel, um, the solar, the, the power from the solar panel is not uh, sufficient. So the battery is the one responsible for supplying energy to these uh, sensors. And we also have uh, soil sensors, which are installed at depths of 15 and 30 centimeters. And uh, we also have uh, uh, the automatic rain gauge. So all of these sensors are uh, automatically uh, designed to get data and uh, collect and uh, get data. So the data are, are once the data are collected, it is uh, tr uh, transmitted into a, a server through a GSM or a cell cellular uh, signal. And uh, so these are GSM equipped. And uh, the server, once the data are already in the server, you can view the website or the data in the visualization um, website. So this is, uh, if you, the, the website, you can find the website uh, by typing in agromet.da.gov.ph. And once you open the website, um, there is a quick survey that you need to answer just to be able to um, know who are the users accessing the, the website. And uh, from, from that, uh, after you finish the survey, you'll be able to access the, the data. So the data can be presented in a tabular form. It is presented in every 15 minutes. And you can also view the data in a graphical form. And we also have a simple analysis of the, of the data collected. You can analyze, uh, I mean, you can see the report in a daily, weekly, monthly, or even annual basis. And we also incorporated um, uh, uh, analysis such as the evapotranspiration using the uh, FAO penman monteith uh, equation. And uh, another analysis is the uh, moisture availability index, which is just a ratio between the rainfall and the uh, evapotranspiration. And uh, the importance and the uses of AWS for agriculture 4.0. So this uh, data, the data collected from AWS can be used in many applications. One, uh, we have the research, of course. Um, you can use the data obtained from this uh, AWS station to characterize the daily and long-term uh, map data and uh, its effect on specific uh, area of interest or research interest can be from can be uh, investigation of the groundwater recharge from rainfall or from the crop uh, water requirements or nutrient leaching so any any uh, research topic that might uh, interest you um, you can uh, use uh, this data to correlate uh, the results of your research to the uh, met data that's obtained by the uh, automatic weather station and the number two is, uh, of course, for agriculture, it can be used in the development of a cropping pattern and calendar based on the availability or, or lack of rainfall in a specific area, especially if uh, uh, your area of concern um, has uh, no available data from the synoptic stations of Bagasa. Um, if uh, you are fortunate to have uh, one AWS installed in that area, then uh, you can use uh, that data to develop cropping pattern, localized uh, cropping pattern and calendar. And uh, you can also use the data as a development of uh, threshold values at different growth stages of uh, crops or plant and use the data to relate uh, possible occurrences of uh, pests and uh, diseases. 
Number three, uh, the, the data of the AWS can be used in uh, disaster risk reduction and management, um, particularly as a local early warning system for flooding and other met hazards, and of course, a tool for local climate change adaptation. So uh, you, can, you can use the amount of rainfall received uh, by the AWS to, to uh, warn um, communities of uh, impending hazards um, in the area. And then uh, number four, weather-based uh, crop insurance application. Um, this can, the data can be used to evaluate compensation against crop damage through uh, improved calibration of crop losses due to abnormal weather conditions or extreme climate events such as uh, La Nina or uh, El Nino. Um, number five, localized real-time and historical weather information. Uh, this can be used in simple farm weather forecasting and uh, micro watershed hydrologic analysis. Um, number six, extension work. Um, the data can be used uh, uh, by farmers who are enrolled to the Farmer Field School, Enhanced Farmer Field School, Climate Field School, and so on. To, and the primary purpose of this data is to educate the farmers and the agripreneurs uh, of uh, the local data in their uh, area and appreciate its application in agriculture. And uh, finally, for instructional purposes. So um, as I've presented before in, in the previous slides, um, the AWS, uh, one of the recipients of uh, AWS are, uh, uh, is the SUCs, are the SUCs, which uh, helps the students to appreciate uh, meter, meta topics in their courses. And uh, um, this, uh, uh, the topics in agrometeorology, uh, is supported by a uh, site visit for, for better familiarization and uh, appreciation of uh, the topic. And the, finally, the challenges and the way forward of uh, uh, AWS. So uh, though I've mentioned that there are already a lot of AWS installed in different parts of the country and uh, the agencies uh, involved or uh, who, who funded uh, the installation of this AWS, and yet uh, there, there's still uh, uh, more AWS needs to be established for agriculture, for local climate adaptation and uh, DRRM. And uh, this uh, data, the, the AWS data that uh, uh, will be installed in the future can help uh, people, especially in areas uh, where, where disasters are prone, are, are uh, more occurring uh, frequently. And uh, the more AWS data, uh, the more AWS uh, stations that we can install uh, are much better. And then uh, the quality availability and accessibility, uh, accessibility of uh, this uh, AWS data are still remain as a challenge. So um, um, some of the AWS data that are being installed are not, the data cannot be viewed online or cannot be accessed online. So, it's one of the pressing uh, challenges and uh, there are also privacy uh, restrictions or data privacy uh, restrictions that uh, hinder the availability of uh, this data to the public. So that's one challenge. And uh, number three, the after sales service of AWS components. So um, this, these are the parts, the AWS parts are replaceable and they are also prone to to, to damage and uh, repair. So while uh, this, uh, the components need uh, repair, um, it is better if uh, the companies uh, providing these components can also provide temporary replacement parts so that uh, while they are under repair, the data can uh, still be collected. And then uh, one also is the strength of cellular signal so that uh, the data uh, collected can be viewed online. So if uh, there's a, a poor cellular signal in the chosen site, um, the data transmitted can also be affected, can be delayed or even worse, uh, it can be, it, the data may not be uh, sent to the uh, server. Then uh, continue capacity enhancement of AWS recipients on its maintenance, troubleshooting data analysis and usage. So. Um, these uh, stations are also managed or uh, maintained by agromet observers for the purpose of uh, maintaining the cleanliness of the station, um, minor maintenance such as uh, wiping the solar panel, checking if there are some debris on the 
um, rain gauge. So um, if these uh, observers uh, uh, are replaced, so the, the, the next uh, uh, people who will be in charge need the capacity enhancement, not only the observers, but also the DRFOs uh, on the side of the recipients, the um, LGUs, they need to know how this data can be used and uh, in the analysis and used uh, for agricultural purposes and other, other uh, purposes. And finally, to develop a strong collaboration with various agencies to expand coverage and installation and use of AWS. So we need to, like I've mentioned, uh, there's still a uh, need to, more AWS still needed to be installed. And uh, this can be done by strong collaboration with the other funding agencies, other um, national government agencies so that uh, the AWS coverage can be expanded and uh, more recipients will be uh, aware of how uh, this AWS can be used. So I think the, that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Engineer Espanto, for, for, sharing, um, for sharing this information about the automatic weather stations. Um, and the innovations that it that it's contributed to to Philippine agriculture. Um, our next presenter is uh, engineer Oliver Silvilla Jr., who is uh, an assistant scientist uh, for soil, water, and environment cluster at uh, at Erie to discuss Automon um, and then Automon's based uh, the Automon based irrigation advisory service IAS. Uh, engineer Silvilla, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. I'll just share my slides. Uh, please let me know if uh, you can see my screen. Hello? I can see the slides. Okay, okay. So, Um, up for a while. I think Oliver, you can also go to slideshow and um, show it that way too. That's the first tab. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry for the uh, technical uh, issue there. So thank you, Martin. So today I will be presenting uh, uh, about the uh, Ottoman pH-based irrigation service. So this is one of the components uh, of water rice project developed by International Rice Research and uh, Field Rice or the Philippine Rice Research Institute in partnership with the uh, Department of Agriculture Philippines. So to start with, uh, this is the uh, basic concept of the irrigation advisory service. Uh, I hope everyone uh, in the audience and the, and the panel is uh, familiar with the AW technology, or we call it the alternate wetting and drying uh, technology. So this is a, a water saving management practice, which could help us save uh, uh, around 30% 30 30 of the water use. Though, uh, though currently uh, the methods uh, in, in, uh, in implementing the AWP or the alternate wetting and drying are mostly done manually. So what we did is to add a real-time automated monitoring uh, features to this uh, uh, te uh, technology uh, using the wireless sensor nodes or we call it uh, the IoT technologies to create an enabling technology. And then uh, the information we gathered from this enabling technology, uh, we wanted to make uh, use of it uh, for us to have an informed driven decision. So we added decision logic and advisory for this one. Uh, it's a targeted advisory uh, for different stakeholders. So we have in here uh, in the, uh, in the uh, diagram, we have uh, three different stakeholders, the farmers, irrigation manager, and then the policy maker. So hopefully this decision logic and advisory will uh, uh, promote uh, coordinated, informed, and empowered stakeholders. 
And if we package everything, uh, we call this uh, Ottoman PH based irrigation advisory service. And why do we need uh, an irrigation advisory ser service in first place? So this is in the hope to address the following challenges. So inefficient water use and management for irrigation, uncoordinated and effective water governance, lack of sustainable, scalable programs providing holistic solutions from field to policy, and lastly, lack of real-time data to drive decision-making for uh, irrigation. Uh, and this, by the way, the uh, conceptual framework for the uh, Ottoman PH-based irrigation advisory service. Uh, as you can see in the picture um, on the left and the right, we have a pump irrigation and then the surface irrigation system. So our system uh, is able to cater different uh, sizes or types of the irrigation systems. On the left, it's a, a small scale uh, irrigation system. And on the right, uh, the, the large scale uh, canal based uh, surface irrigation. And uh, we're hoping to uh, plant uh, sensors. Actually not hoping, we are planting uh, um, sensors to these uh, areas uh, to uh, get the information, water information and then transmit it to the server hosted by the, uh, the country government. At the moment, uh, it is hosted by uh, Phili Philippine Rice Fisheries Institute. And then the information we gather from that uh, monitoring will uh, support an enabled uh, decision for different stakeholders. So the first stakeholders that we are referring to is the far farmer community, which were in their interest are water status in the paddy fields and also the irrigation scheduling. And for the decision makers uh, in the irrigation delivery, their role is to know the water status in the command area, irrigation scheduling, uh, irrigation use efficiency, and coordination and monitoring. So, and the last one, we uh, also tackle on the policy makers. So their role is to uh, know the water and carbon footprint, uh, water demand versus water supplies, water governance, monitoring, reporting, and verification. And this is the uh, irrigation advisory service uh, framework. Uh, so it's this is more of like a, a vision diagram for us uh, working on the Ottoman PH. So we would like to note that uh, this irrigation advisory service does not only focus on the technology but uh, also it focuses on other aspect like uh, the agro-environment, we're in a uh, characterization of biophysical infrastructure and then uh, social aspects are also considered at some point. And this uh, irrigation advisory service could cater different types and scale, as you see on the column on the, on the left, uh, large scale, uh, national irrigation system, con uh, community irrigation system, communal, and then the small scale irrigation system. Uh, in application, we are monitoring uh, different parameters for water and crop, but currently we're only work uh, we are working on the water level in the plots to understand the, uh, the demand. So the information for this will be uh, data will be consolidated. And then we will use data analytics to process the information and make it uh, uh, a sensible inf information for different stakeholders on the right. And then, um, and then we're expecting that the stakeholders could use this information to strengthen the uh, institutional, the management, the water management, and the enabling uh, environment, and also the institutional capacity. Uh, and then, in terms of the Ottoman pH flow of information, we have the Ottoman pH sensor uh, deployed in different locations of the field or our target locations. So, um, and then the information from the, the nodes or the Ottoman pH sensors are, trans, uh, are transmitted to the gateway. So this is using the sub gigahertz RF uh, transmission. And then the gateway will consolidate information then transmit it to the uh, server. So the receiving end from the server is the SMS modem, and then the 
it will go to the database server for processing. Once it's processed, it will be view viewable in the web app and we have also the option to send advisories to different stakeholders. So uh, we're sending a targeted uh, um, information for different stakeholders. So different information for farmers, different for uh, irrigation advice uh, managers, and then also for the uh, policy makers. And this is just a snapshot of the advisory for the, uh, the farmers. So uh, in here, you could see that uh, the levels of the water in the field are given. And for the later version, we have also the battery uh, levels for maintenance purposes. And this picture on the left uh, was taken uh, from one of the demo uh, demo for Ottoman pH in the field. So the farmers are trying to evaluate uh, the features of the Ottoman pH. And this is the snapshot of the interface dashboard uh, or dashboard. So in the interface, in the dashboard, you could see different information here in historical data of water and then also battery level. So these are uh, criticals in both monitoring the parameter of interest that we have and also for diagnostics uh, for the system maintenance. And on the right uh, are just the locations uh, Wherein our sensors are deployed uh, within the within the Philippines, and uh, the next uh, topic here is positioning the Ottoman pH sensor. So we try to use the uh, the GIS or the drone technology for this uh, to pinpoint the the right spot uh, wherein uh, the sensor will matter most or the uh, monitoring will matter most. So. Uh, we try to touch down on three uh, different areas uh, in the rice field, the uh, upstream, midstream, and then the downstream uh, to get the profile of the water. But the uh, majority of our sensors are deployed on the higher levels. Uh, higher levels. So this is the elevation, uh, uh, elevation map, by the way. And uh, in terms of the long-term vision for the irrigation advisory service, we are uh, hoping to uh, deploy and install 300,000 to 500,000 sensors, uh, sensor nodes across the Philippines for real-time monitoring of water, water status, and then hopefully this will provide an effective tool for policymakers to improve water governance by providing uh, real-time data. So this is more of like a dynamic policy, or in, you could adjust on the latest trends if possible. And then national scale uh, of national scale implementation of alternate wetting environment uh, using irrigation advisory to save water and also increase the irrigation service area. So it's a good thing to have the, uh, hopefully to have this uh, uh, national scale uh, implementation of uh, alternate wetting and, and drying. So we, we could save more water and then we could increase the uh, the uh, service area for for planting, and then of course we have also our own sets um, of development challenges. Engineer Silvela, sorry, um, may I ask? Could I ask you to uh, use the next uh, minute or so to wrap up, please? Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. So we have our own sets of development challenges. So uh, we have transmission range uh, challenges, power efficiency, and then environmental robustness and. And also, we included uh, the cost. So the, the challenge here is to make the uh, the the sensors more uh, cost effective and affordable affordable to farmers. And then, uh, in terms of the other challenges, so we are more pertaining to the deployment challenges. So we have the uh, back end infrastructure, uh, hardware manufacturing and development, and then also challenges in maintenance. Um, creating an enabling environment and then institutional capacity. Hopefully this will be covered on the discussion later. And then the last slide is uh, thanks to everyone who contributed to uh, the water rice project and especially in the development of the, the Ottoman PH as an irrigation advisory service. Thank you.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Engineer Silveta, for your presentation on, uh, on Ottoman-based uh, irrigation advisory services. Um, now, moving on to our, our last speakers, we have a, we have a duo. Um, we have with us two representatives from the, from the private sector, from a, from a company called Freak Labs. Um, so the, from Freak Labs, Mr. Christopher Wang is the uh, president, um, and, the, and uh, Jacinta Pluchinski, who is the managing partner um, at Freak Labs, which is a tech startup focusing on agriculture, environment, conservation, and wildlife monitoring. Um, <clears throat> so um, we would like to uh, we'd like to invite the two of you to uh, to present uh, on your uh, in situ soil health monitoring for conservation tool. Um, and the, the presentation I've understood is will also include an overview of creating a system to uh, to monitor soil changes over a long period of time. So, um, Mr. Wang, Ms. Pluchinski, um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'll just get the screen, the slides going. So... It, uh, can you guys see the uh, slides? Yes, yes. Okay, excellent. Great. Um, so, my name's Jacinta and Akiba and I will be talking about um, how we're developing an affordable in situ soil health monitoring system that will be deployed for the long term, basically so conservationists and agriculturalists can gather data to better understand soil properties and health and how it responds to different kinds of land management practices. The um, collaboration is a four, there are four partners in the, in the collaboration and each bringing a different skill set and um, expertise. Here at Freak Labs, we're doing the technical development of the system and the implementation. We're working with the Soil Science Department at Monash University here in, in Melbourne, Australia. And then we have two key stakeholders. One is Bush Heritage Australia, which is an NGO that manages 11.3 million hectares of uh, depleted farming and grazing land. And so they're looking to restore the soil and the, the ecosystem on the, those lands. And the second stakeholder is Parks Victoria, which is a government entity that manages 4 million hectares of parks and reserve lands in the state of Victoria in Australia. The, the goal of the system is to create an accessible and scalable um, long-term soil health monitoring system. Um, we want to record how soil health changes with different managers, management practices so we can um, focus on developing better land management practices. And this can apply both to conservation, but it can also apply to agricultural farming practices. So the goals for this stage of the development is to collect a baseline of soil data, and then to verify that the data that we've collected using the census that we've um, put together in the, in the system, um, how accurate that is a, against a lab analysis of the same soil or same soil area. We wanna verify the accuracy of the data basically. And then we'll be looking and exploring ways that the data we've collected can be used as an indicator of soil and ecological health. So that's the stage for the pilot. Um, I'm sure we don't need to um, explain to, in too much detail why we want to monitor for soil health. Uh, okay, can we go to the oh, next slide? Okay. <laughs> Sorry um, obviously, we're here with um, many experts in soil and farming and so on, so we won't spend too much time here. Um, but basically, um, soil is the foundation. So, um, soil supports the microbial ecosystems that sustain plants, animals and us. Um, but they, it also regulates um, water as well as cycles nutrients, filters pollutants. Um, but surprisingly, there's very few studies and equipment that quantitatively record how soil changes over the long term. Um, so how do we monitor the soil health at this stage? We're working with the soil scientists at Monash Uni to determine what properties we want to measure for the, for the pilot. Um, so we'll be collecting the soil moisture at three different depths. We'll be collecting the soil temperature at three at various depths. We'll also be um, looking at CO2 fluctuation as an indicator of microbial activity, the soil pH, and then the ambient air temperature, pressure, and humidity um, in, in the environment. Um, what we're not monitoring at the moment is the NPK levels. Um, and we'll talk a little bit in the challenges of how the selection of the sensors, the characterization, and the cal calibration is one of the challenges of 
that we face in the development of the system. Um, so how are we going to do it? What does the system look like? And you'll see that there's a, a base foundation that's similar to the Automon um, system that Oliver just uh, spoke about. So we'll have a number of different sensor stations that collect the readings and then use the LoRa wireless protocol to send it to the gateway. Um, the gateway will then collect that data and send it via cellular to a server on the cloud. Um, and that's where the data then becomes open source through an API. Um, one of the challenges in Australia that we have here is Australia is a very big country <laughs> and very remote. Um, so we're also looking at uh, different ways we can collect the data. For example, if there's no cell coverage. Um, so looking at things, for example, like a, a drone that can be flown over and collect um, data from the gateways, um, as well as also humans on motorbikes, for example. Oh, um, so this is this is an example of the hardware that we've developed so far. Um, so, and the idea is that this is going to be an open source um, platform for uh, soil health monitoring. Um, so, an important thing was to have it Arduino based, so that um, it's accessible to people that may not be a specialty in writing, may not uh, specialize in writing software, but um, but have more of a domain expertise, like you know, for soil scientists and um, conservationists. So this sensor board has uh, uh, connectors for four soil moisture sensors initially, um, one pH sensor. Um, initially, we're just going to monitor the temperature of the top soil, um, and then and then gauge how effective that is, and also like like mentioned before, the air pressure, temperature, and uh, humidity. Um, we're also using a wireless protocol called LoRa, which which is um, a relatively recent one. It stands for long range, and it gets very good range. And we'll be using that at either 900 megahertz or 433 megahertz, which would get better range. But we need to see how things go. And um, of course, this is going to be um, solar rechargeable. Um, so, like right now, we are testing out the system in their in its ability to measure uh, the sensors and how sensitive they are at the moment we're using um, soil moisture sensors that are commercial and retail um, and the idea though is that we're going to we're going to develop soil moisture sensors um, that that are going to be optimized for both like cost as well as accuracy and um, a lot of the soil sensors ha have uh, are kind of legacy, so they're expensive because they use technologies that were expensive at the time they were developed, which was like 20 years ago. And so now it's possible to reduce the cost a lot and still use sophisticated techniques like time domain reflectometry or frequency domain, et cetera, and capacitive. Um, and of course, we're also doing a lot of the um, wireless testing. So this is just a quick little video. Um, so the actual, the soil moisture sensors are quite sensitive. So you can see like, um, like you get a good response. This is just in a cup of water. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to send it to um, the soil science department at Monash University in order for them to calibrate, or to calibrate the sensors according to the soil, the soil samples. This is our uh, cellular board. Um, so we're already, we've already designed a couple of them for our pilot. One of our challenges is gonna be in uh, manufacturing. So we'll be scaling this to um, initial small scale manufacturing and then later full production. Um, and this works off 3G. Uh, and of course, one of the big things is range testing. So with the LoRa protocol, we're easily getting uh, a kilometer. We're going to try and get um, to tune it, tune it to get around three to four kilometers, which would be a good range that we could start using um, automated drones like that are uh, periodic, that collect data periodically. Um, and so for our next steps, so Jacinta, are you handling this one? Yeah, I'll grab this one. Yep. So um, the, the next step is basically to run the pilot in early, um, in Feb. And the aim is to test the reliability and the robustness of the system itself, um, to look at the accuracy and the of the data, and to gather more of a wish list feature for the second iteration of the the system. Um, 
we are, as Akiba mentioned, it's a small um, run because one of the challenges um, that uh, you, you, when you're implementing systems is that once it gets into the environment, um, many things can go wrong. So we, we try to isolate what can go wrong um, so that we're able to, to fix it before we do a, a bit larger scale deployment. So, oh, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I added something too. Um, but um, one of the next steps also is we're starting on the parts procurement for um, a full production run. And the reason is because we need to start thinking ahead towards full production, like at least six months in order so that once kind of the goal flag is given that we're able to go directly into production. But anyways, so. Um, so, so they're, they're the next steps. And then of course, there's always a few good challenges just to keep things interesting. So, oh, okay. Uh, so, um, some of the challenges that we face are, uh, basically the calibration and characterization of the sensors, which, you know, like soil, soil is notoriously hard to, um, to characterize because like each soil has different, like is different. And so we have to, we have to calibrate each sensor based on the soil type. Um, and then the other thing is that the soil calibration will drift over time. And so we need to measure that and see like, do we need to calibrate over time or can we, um, or can we uh, make adjustments in software in order to compensate? Um, another one is the corrosion of the sensors. And so these, since these will be in, in the soil, then they'll be in contact with, uh, with soil. And so like there's a big chance of oxidation and um, corrosion. And so we're uh, trying to mitigate that using different um, techniques and also to not introduce any chemicals that will kind of leach into the soil as well, or, or any materials that will leach into the soil. Like Jacinta said, um, the remote deployment is gonna be a big challenge. Uh, we're gonna try and avoid satellite communications because it's very expensive. And so we're part of the project is also going to be in um, designing, uh, designing custom drones for automated uh, data collection. And so, and so these are called data mules and basically they'll just be kind of, uh, if we can get the wireless range good enough, then we can just have these drones fly a pre-recorded flight path, you know, once per day or once per few days and then collect, collecting the data. And so that's one of the things we're looking at as well as um, doing non-contact data collection, which would be like, like somebody driving a car or a motorcycle and as they're going through um, an area, then pinging the gateways in order to collect their data. And just to jump in on the, so one of the other issues here in Australia is um, the main uh, telecommunicate tele, telco here um, runs their 3G network on the 850 megahertz band, um, but they're going to be phasing out 3G. So we need to think about future proofing it um, as far as cellular moving to 4G and so on um, in a couple of years. Yes, yes. And actually that's like, you know, like doing a 4G, like LTE uh, cell devices is actually going to be interesting as well as some, there's some low cost satellite technologies that are coming into play. So we'll see how that goes. Um, um, but yeah, so also we need to worry about animals. So anim like animals that chew through cables. So solar is going to be a bit difficult um, unless we have embedded on the enclosures. And then also we need to make sure that if we have solar panels, they're not gonna get stolen. And that's like a big issue too. Um, and of course we have our, like, so luckily like we're pretty well focused on, like we're pretty skill, skilled in, or have a lot of experience in the manufacturing side of things, but we're gonna try and reduce the cost of the system so that it's accessible. Because right now, like soil health monitoring systems are basically considered scientific industrial. And so they're thousands of dollars. And we're gonna try and reduce that to you know, like to, I think it's hard to say exactly, but hopefully like a retail price that would be like under a hundred dollars. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, and then, um, and scaling the manufacturing to full, full production. So, and that's our presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so hello from, I'm in Japan by the way, and Jacinta is in Australia. Yes, hello from down under. <laughs>
Wonderful. Um, okay. th thank you, me... thank you, Mr. Ryan and, and Ms. Plutinsky for your presentation. Um, so, so now, um, now that we've learned about kind of several examples of of, uh, of digital tools um, that are already known, there've been a number of very interesting questions coming in, uh, which we'll address in a bit um, on how they can really much more like directly benefit our farmers. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to just kind of hear each of our panelists' thoughts on on, on some of the challenges that you described. Um, surrounding both development and deployment of these these uh, ICTs, um, particularly for agricultural purposes, um, <clears throat> and then I'd also like to just maybe you know circle back to the title of our webinar today, which is Agriculture 4.0 and the Future. So not just reflecting on the past, but also looking at, at kind of some of the perspectives for the future. Um, we had we heard some of the kind of long term visions um, that were described. Um, so it would be nice to, to hear some of our panelists' perspectives on that um, and the future of agriculture. Um, but maybe just to start off, um, I'd, I'd like to launch a little poll for our participants, um, for our audience. So you'll see a pop up on your screen and, um, and, and we'd like you to answer why, why, why is the pace of moving towards Ag 4.0 so slow? So is, is it the lack of back-end infrastructure or is it uh, manufacturing and deployment capacity, uh, investment capacity of farmers, institutional capacity, um, or lack of an enabling environment? So I think I'd like to know from, from our audience, um, what you think are the, the biggest barriers to moving towards uh, Ag 4.0? So please um, take a moment to, uh, to vote. And um, <clears throat> do we have some of the results already? As we uh, as we pull up those results, I would uh, I'd like to thank the audience for, um, for participating in this poll. Um, so yes, here it, it seems uh, that lack of investment capacity of farmers um, is the is the biggest barrier, um, followed by by lack of an enabling environment. Um, I think what, what, what we can see here is that, you know, there is, there is a lot of, of back-end infrastructure and, and, um, and, in, and not so much institutional capacity, but really the, the, the political, but also the investment environment, uh, the moving more at the, at the grassroots level. So I'd like to hear from our panelists um, and actually hear, hear the same thing from you. Um, so let's zero in on each of the options that we, that we, provided, um, that we provided earlier. So um, for Engineer Espanto, I'd like to uh, call on you. Um, in terms of backend infrastructure, why do you think the pace of moving towards Ag 4.0 is slow? Yep, uh, thank you for that question. Well, in the perspective of uh, um, the, the government uh, agency, particularly uh, the Department of Agriculture, um, the back end is for infrastructure is uh, really important for the adoption of these technologies. So uh, some of the farmers, uh, uh, particularly here in the, in the Philippines or in, in other uh, areas of, of the country where um, uh, they are, the farmers are not yet exposed to this kind of technology and how, how these farmers are going to, to adopt, um, the, the, the backend infra infrastructure is really important uh, um, in the sense that um, they will, they are able, the, the, the adapters or the, the farmers uh, will be able to know how to troubleshoot um, um, the, the sensors that uh, they, they use for agriculture. So um, uh, the lack of uh, uh, proper training on the uh, monitoring and maintenance of this equipment is also one and um, yeah I think that's uh, one of the uh, the roadblocks uh, why uh, the adapters or the uh, the farmers um, have a slow pace in uh, uh, adapting uh, to agriculture or uh, ICT technologies for agriculture. Great. No, thank, thank you for that. And, and I think for the, ne the next option, looking at, at manufacturing and deployment capacity, um, I'd like to throw that to, uh, to Mr. Wang and Ms. Ms. Puczynski. What is, what, where do you think um, the pace, uh, what, where do you think the barriers are in, in, in moving towards Ag 4.0? 
Um, I, I think that like uh, w one of the problems that we often see is that there's a lot of kind of prototype systems that are developed, but um, there's no thought towards taking it to manufacturing. And I think like um, designing to get a product manufactured versus designing a product to be functional are two different things. Um, so, and I think a lot of it is that like for manufacturing engineers need to work more closely with the factories and also go to the factories and understand how things are made. And the other, the other thing is if we can build up more of an understanding on the engineering side for manufacturing, then it's possible to reduce costs and actually make a lot of products much more accessible as well as getting them into the hands of people rather than right now people are creating these systems but they're only able to deploy like you know five or ten at a time whereas like i think when we think of when we take on a project and we start thinking well how can we scale this to a thousand you know ten thousand and so that's where we um and so we kind of as we're designing we're kind of preparing for that and talking to factories and parts and, and suppliers so to, to add to that, part of it is um, access to the manufacturing ecosystem that um, e exists in, in China, which is where the suppliers are, which is where the factories are. And that can be from um, even import export difficulties. It can be um, awareness of what's what, what's out there and how to how to work with that. So there's a there's a there's a lot of um, obstacles. Um, that people face in being able to scale to to sort of you know five hundred thousand units and so on, and it's a whole management pro process. You, you you need resources to put towards that kind of scale and manu of manufacturing, and oh. that's separate to the deployment, <laughs> which is a, has a whole another suite of of processes and systems and replacement parts and like you're building up a web of, of interconnected parts. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Right. I just like to add one more thing, which is that um. Like in manufacturing, I think it's really important and we try to do this as much as possible is to use off the shelf components and especially like, and having like, and having a lot of them available for repair and maintenance. Cause I think one reason why projects fail is because as soon as they break and all, all devices will break, as soon as they break, there's no parts for maintenance and people have are already gone and working on other projects, so. That's a huge issue for us. And that's part of manufacturing is designed for maintenance. Yeah. No, that, that, that's extremely interesting. Um, I think, I think that, 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 that segues very nicely into, um, into the next one where, um, where I'd like to invite Mr. De Dios um, to speak about the barriers in terms of investment capacity of farmers, which also got the highest kind of rating in terms of the biggest barrier. Mr. De Dios, what is your, what do you have thoughts on that? Um, regarding the, the phase of moving towards agriculture 4.0 for the farmer's point of view. Yeah, I think investment and the type or the, the land holdings of the farmer, especially for rice is one of the factors in modernizing or mechanization that's why one of the uh, goal of the da for today is to consolidate the lands not necessarily physical consolidation but i'm um, able for the, some technical management uh, it is very hard to mechanize a 0.5 hectare rice land you, uh, you invest in mechanization or some sort of uh, high-tech equipment with that uh, uh, piece of land. Yeah, I think uh, uh, that's one of the problems in terms of rice. Right. No, that, 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 that's a very good, very good insight. Um, and for, um, I'd like to invite engineer Salcedo to speak about some of the barriers in terms of institutional capacity. Okay, uh, so I think um, projects and developments coming in from um, institutions or like um, the university, for example, where I'm in, um, 
all these developments are aimed at propelling um, us and the agricultural sector to agriculture um, 4.0. However, I think there is a disconnect in the technology transfer. Um, we have a lot of, we have these amazing products, but the, the adoption of the end users or the stakeholders is where it's um, quite problematic. Um, we, the challenge here is how are we going to engage our farmers and make them interested in trying out these new technologies and applying it to their farm activities. So um, the, the institution, I think, is uh, capable enough to produce all these amazing technologies that will help um, push forward uh, the agricultural sector into the digital um, uh, how the digital era, uh, so to say. So I think it, the problem here is the, the technology transfer on how the farmers will adopt this products. Yeah. Right, no, no, absolutely. Um, then I think for um, just uh, to kind of co wrap that up, um, I'd like to invite engineer Silvela from, from Erie um, to speak about the, the, the lack of an, enabler, an, an enabling environment policy um, as, a, as a barrier to moving towards Ag 4.0. Yeah, uh, so my point of view here is that uh, all the points that our colleagues, uh, fe fellow panelists has mentioned actually contributes to the enabling environment as a whole. So providing a, a back-end uh, support, uh, a good back-end support, manufacturing and uh, development, investment of capacity for the farmers, and then is institutional uh, capacity capacity if we have this uh, on higher side this will pro provide uh, a proper cushion uh, for the enabling environment but then i think um, policy also uh, plays a big role uh, in providing cushion for technology like uh, agriculture 4.0 technology that we are presenting so the policy that we are developing will uh, have a, a strong help uh, to ensure like the sustainability of this uh, agri 4.0 technology that's why we also part of our motivation for uh, uh, part of our motivation is to create a tool uh, that will aid or support the policy shaping or maybe a data driven policy if you could have that one but then i think uh, yeah in terms of uh, pace um, focusing on the policy also helping uh, shape a proper policy will also uh, uh, fast track the uh, the movement for uh, the agriculture agriculture four point oh. You're great. No, one 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 thing, and thank you, um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Engineer Silvela. I think one one of the things I'm 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 kind of extracting from this is that there the any of these challenges, any of these barriers is 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 not happening in a silo. I think um, a lot of the responses have have referred to some of the other challenges uh, as well. And I think, you know, it is a very kind of intricate web um, of, of different factors that, that really kind of pose this, this one large barrier, larger barrier to move towards, uh, towards agriculture 4.0. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, it, it, as we move forward and, and, and kind of addressing those challenges, it is, there is really the need for, for a very holistic approach uh, in terms of creating not only the, the the demand but also the the enabling policy environment and also the tools to actually be able to to bring these innovations to scale um at a and then to bring it to a level that that it will really have the, the highest impact um <clears throat> for 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 agricultural producers um so the, moving to the next round of, of questions and this i would like to invite all panelists to um to respond um, what are what are some of the uncertainties and, and risks in in digitalization? Um, I'd like to maybe to kind of kick it off. I'd like to uh, to ask Mr. Mr. Wang um, to to provide your thoughts. So sorry, uh, just uh, getting my controls down. Um, I think so. Also, and Jacinta, like, because uh, Jacinta and I both work together and we deal with a lot of um, issues concerning um, like 
technology, especially in like kind of like internationally and um, like we work with World Bank. So dealing with technology in places like uh, the Middle East or Egypt or like developing countries. It's um, there's like the, the challenges, I think, is just that there's a huge digital divide. And so and there's a skepticism towards technology, like especially for farmers, if like if they've been doing it the same way that their parents and grandparents have done things, then there needs to be a really strong incentive for them to change. And so, and I think like truthfully, this is where um, like probably government policy might need to come in because, um, you know, like otherwise, otherwise, you know, like, and then, well, so that's one of the things. And the other one is that like, um, like in the US, there's a huge digital divide where uh, large institutional ag agriculture, like large farms have access to a lot of technology and data, whereas the small uh, farmers do not. And so like, and so I think a lot of the work is really identifying like where these digital divides are and like trying to even out the playing field and also, um, and also kind of explain the technology to people in terms that they understand. And I think that's something that Jacinta and I try really hard to work on is, um, is uh, speaking the language rather than using industri industry jargon on technology, trying to speak in plain terms. So Jacinta. I would also add to that is that there's a lot of information and data that's being collected by this, um, these different types of technologies. So who has access to that and who's controlling that? Um, and so one of the things, say, for the soil um, monitoring project that we're doing is to have the data open so that it's, um, it can be used in a reference as a reference for other um, deployments of, of the system or the system itself can be um, adapted in different ways. Um, so I think privacy, not, not privacy, but access to information and all the data and how that's disseminated is another really big, um, big factor. Yeah. I yeah, I just, last thing to add is like, I think one thing that we do need to watch out for is um, like large indust industrial suppliers tying technology and data to their products. So only the people that purchase from them have access to it, to that. And I think that's a big issue. So like we're, bit, we're advocates for like open data and open source. Right, no, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> engineers Silvela and, and Despanto, um, what are your thoughts on, on the uncertainties and risks in digitalization? Uh, for me, um, what are the uncertainties and risks in digitalization? So I was thinking uh, whatever risk that uh, is posed to the industry 4.0 or the, uh, the 4.0 in uh, revolution, so it was uh, will be uh, brought um, to the domains of the agriculture 4.0 also. So I am I am thinking uh, possible ways on the security and uh, privacy of information. I think it's somehow related to the 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 the, the, the points that Akiba and uh, Lucinda has pointed out. But uh, I think uh, in terms of security and pri uh, and privacy, I think. Uh, it's good that uh, we uh, think of it as a developer and uh, we try to uh, uh, ensure that uh, we ensure that we have this uh, security and privacy in terms of our system. Well, well as we develop uh, uh, the different uh, ICT or uh, agriculture 4.0 technologies. All right. Okay, and uh, Engineer Espanto? Yep, I think uh, the uh, Akiba and Jacinta and uh, Oliver has already mentioned the uh, um, important points of why uh, there are uncertainties and uh, the risk involved in the digitalization. But I would like to add on the aspect of uh, the capital or investment capital of the uh, stakeholders. Um, new technologies come uh, very quickly. You have a new technology today and uh, maybe one, two, three, three years uh, after there's uh, another uh, new one. So um, 
farmers uh, or stakeholders can't cope with the uh, advancement of uh, these technologies. And while they are still learning uh, the, the recent one, in one or two, three, four years, there will be another one coming. So that's uh, one uh, uncertainty in digitalization. And of course, uh, the stakeholders need to uh, first know uh, why they are um, choosing uh, to digitalize their uh, farming operation or their farm activities. So uh, there's, there's need to be uh, uh, information uh, awareness uh, that the stakeholders need to be informed uh, why they need to digitalize and uh, if there are problems that uh, will come um, by uh, uh, doing a digitalization in their activities, uh, there has to be a support from the manufacturers, support from uh, different uh, stakeholders, different uh, government agencies. And uh, if these things uh, all come together, then uh, the, these uncertainties will uh, be reduced to a greater extent. So, yeah. Oh, great, thank you. And and maybe just as a as a final um, a final thoughts also from uh, Mr. De Dios and from Engineer Salcedo about the uncertainties and risks in digitalization. Hi. So I think uh, digitalization will be an amazing um, development to our agricultural sector. However, one of the uncertainties that um, I think may hinder the the fast uh, the, the pacing of the digitalization is that the adoption of our farmers just like um, what uh, Patrick said earlier um, new technologies come and go so um, farmers are especially our older farmers will have a hard time trying to uh, learn and adopt these new technologies and there are also we also have to take into consideration the farmers who are quite hesitant to sway from traditional practices um, since they are used to it the, this is what they know and this is how they will do it so we also have to consider them in in the development of these technologies and in the um, promotion of these new um, products also uh, we have to take into consideration the the different factors such as the governance policies and regulations um, and the we have to upgrade or improve uh, our current systems uh, farming systems to to match the whatever is going to be applied when um, we're trying to digitalize the, uh, the uh, our agricultural practices yeah that's it thank you Great. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Mr. De Dios, any, any thoughts? Yeah, I think one of the uh, possible uh, uncertainties and risks is uh, uh, going digitalization needs uh, a high, high initial investment. Another thing is uh, there, which is uh, related to security, data security, uh, for example, some abuse and uh, misinformations. I think that's all they can share. All right, great. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to, to all our panelists. Um, I think your, your, your insights have definitely provided uh, kind of our audience with a, with a wider perspective on, on developing and deploying Agri 4.0 technologies. Um, but also kind of some of the factors to watch out for as, as we as we continue to utilize digital tools in the ag sector um, to address some of these global challenges. Um, and so I would like to open up the chat box. We're, we're, we're running a little short of time. Um, so we'll try to accommodate a couple more, uh, maybe two, two more questions. Um, but as, as, as we wait for some of those questions to come in, um, there was one very interesting question that came in <clears throat> from uh, I think it was one of our students that uh, that had been in the first session, um, and maybe just open up the floor to our panelists on on what would you what would you recommend? Um, you know, looking towards the future, and 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 these you know our student participants are the are the future. Um, what what skills and and what programs um, 
do you do you think or that could be developed by by the younger generation to to really um, <clears throat> to really enable them to contribute to to Ag 4.0 uh, in the near future in the near future and 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 the longer term as well. So I'd like to just open up the floor to our, our panelists um, to whomever would like to respond to that. Um, I could say that, like, I feel like it's really important to understand, um, uh, like, I think the technology side is very important, and especially like, you know, I think programming is essential, but I think for agriculture, it's really important for students to also learn about farming and how, how, uh, how, like, how you farm and like how you grow things and what are the traditional techniques and because then you'll have a better un insight on how the technology can fit into that whole flow. Like the worst thing you, the worst thing to have is trying to push a technology, like non-farmers trying to push uh, an agriculture technology on farmers because um, there's gonna be a lack of understanding and um, like, well, yeah, so. Any, anyone else have any insights or, or, or tips or advice for, for, for our students? I would, um, to, to add to that, I would also say actually programming experience is really important as well. Um, even if you don't go deep into a language, if you can understand um, programming concepts and ideas, um, and also even um, product development concepts and ideas, then you're able to have different kinds of conversations with people that might have more expertise in that in that field. Um, so I think I, I think depending on where you want to sit and where you you gravitate towards, there's many different um, inroads in. It could be at, at a at a at a um, level where you're interacting with the farmers directly, and I think Akiba's point there is is crucial. Um, it could be at the product development level. It could be at the the data level. So um, exploring each of those um, areas, and of course, our, our the the the, the business, our businessmen students to provide the investment environment as well would be uh, would be very very good. <laughs> um, do any of our other panelists have have any thoughts? Uh, can I add, uh, Martin? Sure. Uh, so I think I'm on the same shoes with the students. So actually, I I don't have a. When I entered Erie, I don't have any agricultural background, so probably we're in the same, same, because my background is more on electronics. So I was thinking uh, if I am on the shoes of the youth, I think it's important that I would agree with the PIBA that we learn farming and then the basics of it. And if you have the skills of the technology, which is uh, actually embedded on our daily lives, you have cell phones and then different technologies we're using, so it's not that hard to... Uh, to understand the technology at the, at the moment, but farming, we need to put in some time there to understand the basics. Uh, the importance of that is, uh, if you know the basics and then the, uh, the details of farming, uh, if you are developing like a tool, it will be effective. Rather than you have been, uh, you don't have any information about farming, then you develop, develop a tool or you have limited, then it's probably end up a crash uh, technology in the future if you are doing that. No, abs absolutely. Thank you, uh, thank you, Engineer Silvela. That um, you know, uh, you know, our, 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 the, the 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 younger generation are the, are the agents of change and are going to be the ones that uh, that are really going to be be operationalizing a lot of and using a lot of these interventions that that we've presented today. Um, do we have any any other um, any other thoughts uh, hi. from our from our panelists? Hi. Um... Um, I think what everyone has said earlier is um, like uh, the, the, the main things that we have to consider when we're trying to engage the youth um, in more and more in agriculture. So one of the things that I think I would like to add is to encourage our um, younger gener the younger generation to look at agriculture not uh, not as something like um, uh, like a dying like a dying um how do you say this uh, industry or like it's it's for the poor or 
something like that. Um, since I, I know that most of the younger people nowadays don't see agriculture as something that's um, that's going to help them in their careers after um, college or something that will earn them money or you know uh, so I think that's one one thing that we can help um, uh, the the youth uh, right now since they're all techie we don't have the problem we don't um, have really the problem in the programming part in the, the development of these technologies it's the appreciation for agriculture for farming I think that's what we have to instill on them so yeah that's it thank you no one, wonderful that that's that's a re that's actually a very nice kind of um, concluding concluding remark for our for our panel discussion um, <clears throat> so so to conclude this session and and the webinar um, we also have with us Dr. Manuel Jose Regalado, who is the uh, Chief Science and Research Specialist in Sciences uh, at, uh, at Phil Rice, um, to wrap up this session and to deliver some closing remarks. Um, Dr. Regalado, uh, please, the floor is yours. Dr. Regalado, you're on mute. Good morning, good morning. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I actually enjoyed <laughs> this webinar. I learned many things, including the perspectives and views of the students. They're very interesting. And um, based on the discussions, um, I think agriculture 4.0 is already happening in other parts of the world, even in the Asian region. So while we are here discussing about uh, things that concerns uh, agriculture 4.0, uh, we must uh, start preparing our country for uh, this uh, new agricultural revolution. Next slide. Can you go, go to the second slide? Yeah, to, during the discussions with the students, we have uh, several challenges, like uh, demographics. One student mentioned about the world population by uh, it, I think that is the uh, second second slide, please. Um, the, the, um, the population having of the world by 2050 will be with uh, between eight billion people and ten more than ten billion people. And then also there was a mention about natural resources uh, man management um, because uh, truly our natural resources will become um, will, will become scarce. And um, another student mentioned about climate change and we have to do, do 
can you go backward second uh, after the first slide after the title slide yeah that so and really we're having problems producing food but there's a lot of wasted food and we have to also deal with this and all of these uh, problems are intensifying the what we call hunger and food scarcity problem i'm particularly concerned about hunger not really the hunger per se but hidden hunger hidden hunger especially for the the, the the children from zero or age zero and to five years old because uh, during this uh, stage of growth of the child the it is also the time that uh, the the brain um, develops and by five years, by five years of age, the, the brain has already fully developed. And uh, if the children, if most of the children here in our, uh, in our country, especially in the depressed areas, are, there's a problem with hidden hunger, then uh, most of them might have have underdeveloped brains which will, will result in um, below average intelligence quotient and uh, that will be a big uh, problem for the Philippines because uh, as you know the median age of the Philippines is 23 years of age and that means half of the more than 100 million people are below this age and, and a large proportion are in this uh, age from zero to uh, seven years old. So we must uh, really produce um, enough food, not only for uh, the majority, but especially for these young uh, children. Next. So to meet these challenges, uh, will require concentrated effort among governments, the government, investors, the and innovative agricultural technologies. That and it can be done, but uh, you know we need to really disrupt the system. Agriculture 4.0 is more of a <laughs> disruptive uh, uh, set of uh, technologies which uh, next which uh, can which will be able to uh, be, be done with newer technologies in um, the, the current agriculture secretary Um, mentioned about um, agriculture 4.0 but um, next slide please the agriculture 4.0 must uh, is coming agricultural revolution must be a green one meaning it is with a science and technology at its heart and uh, it must consider uh, both the demand side and value chain supply side and the poor of the food scarcity situation using technology not simply for the sake of innovation but to improve and address the real needs of consumers and also to re-engineer the, the value chain. Next slide. So this is uh, in his column in a daily newspaper, the DA Secretary, Agriculture Secretary, Dr. William Dar, 
suggested four approaches in technologizing agriculture under Industry 4.0 or ID4, which uh, consists of producing different, differently using new techniques and using new technologies to bring uh, food production to consumers and increasing efficiencies in the food chain and incorporating cross-industry technologies and application. Um, I lifted a, a figure from the next slide, please. I lifted a figure from uh, Agriculture 4.0, the future of farming technologies. And you would see um, these uh, techniques or technologies um, some of which were discussed today, like um, Internet of Things, uh, precision agriculture, data analytics, drone technology, which are actually cross-industry technologies that are being applied now to agriculture. And uh, also using new technologies like uh, vertical and urban farming and producing differently using new techniques like hydroponics, use of bio, biological plastics and algae feedstocks. Uh, we, with the discussions, we have barely touched what will, what's now going on. But uh, later, you will see there are more technologies like desert agriculture, seawater farming, genetic modification like the CRISPR technology. And have you heard about cultured meats? Uh, first week of December, I read a news about uh, in Singapore, it was approved now, uh, chicken bites, but it's actually um, synthetic chicken. Uh, it's produced by a company um, called a U.S. company called uh, Eat Just. Eat meaning you eat just. Um, maybe just because it's just because you don't you do justice to the animals that are being killed. So when you eat this cultured meat, you 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 will not think about animals being slaughtered. And of course, 3D printing, which is and others are nanotechnology, AI or artificial intelligence, the blockchain and food sharing and crowd farming. But uh, while we all have these uh, technologies, uh, let me end by saying, quoting what, or regarding the discussion about the uh, po policy or the government through the DA is actually uh, supportive of uh, in industrializing and modern, modernizing uh, agriculture. That's why we now have a food security and resiliency framework. And, um, and part of this will be strategies that will uh, be using agriculture 4.0 technologies. And um, it aims to really ha have a food secure Philippines, a resilient Philippines with prosperous farmers and fisher folk. Earlier, the, when the students were asked, or even us were asked, if we uh, want to be millionaires, of course, so who, would not not, who would not want to be? <laughs> Majority answered yes, uh, 60, more than 60%. And um, we wanted also farmers not just to be recipients of technologies, but also be prosperous. Not only farmers, but also the fishers, fisher folks. And in and I appreciate one speaker from on the uh, Sar Sarai uh, to to Tony Tonyan mentioned about uh, the transfer of technology, which will be part of my uh, 
closing statement. Next slide. I, I lifted this from a PhD student who wrote an article, Farming into the Future, Sustainability, and its Stakeholder Vision. Um, so it says, agriculture and biological engineers want to solve big problems. And there are many big problems for us to work on. Ending hunger, ensuring adequate food production in a changing climate, creating energy efficient and energy producing systems with zero carbon footprint and reducing agricultural pollution to protect the health of people and the ecosystem. The solutions will be diverse. Precision agriculture, remote sensing, automation and robotics, hydroponic, urban farming, new genetics, all those and more are the future of agriculture. However, while that technology is wonderful, it is, it's not the entire solution. Engaging stakeholders and hearing their views about what sustainable agriculture and agricultural livelihoods can look like will help us see beyond our assumptions to find appropriate workable long-term uh, solutions. So we must also engage the farmers, other stakeholders and hear their views. Even, even before developing this or introducing these technologies so that in the end, all the risks and our centerpieces can be worked out for the adoption of these technologies that will lead us to an industrialized and modernized agriculture um, using the agriculture 4.0 technologies. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Regalado, for, for providing that uh, that summary of what of what transpired today, and for kind of the the thoughts and and uh, the, the food for thought. I think that's uh, it's it's very very good. Um, <clears throat> before we be, before we officially close the in, the entire event, um, may I ask everyone to just turn on your camera so we can take a group photo, um, and um, and then we'll move with some. Uh, some household announcements, but let's do the, the, the group photo first. So if everyone has their camera on, um, I will count to three and uh, so we can all smile and, and make sure that our, you know, our, hair, is, our hair is good. Um, so please, thank you very much. Uh, one, two, three. All right, thank you. We will, we will share that group photo with everyone. Um, so that uh, that concludes our webinar, uh, Agriculture 4.0 and the Future um, and uh, Perspectives, Challenges and Visions. Um, I'd like to thank everyone uh, on behalf of the entire ERI team and all presenters uh, who tuned in to watch our online event today. <clears throat> uh, just a quick reminder for those who need a certificate of attendance, um, please do go to um, the following web address, so bit.ly slash agri for future eval to complete our short evaluation um maybe someone could put the the web address in in the chat box um so that's bit.ly slash agri the number four future eval uh, and after which please allow the the erie team to uh, to send your certificate of attendance in uh, within the next week or two so again, I'm, uh, I'm Martin Packer. It has been my pleasure um, and uh, the entire ERI team's pleasure to, uh, to be your moderator and host today. And uh, please allow me to uh, wish you a very nice rest of the day and, uh, and a very tasty lunch. Thank you very, very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.